This is released for the sake of education. This is a brief key insight about all the concepts of the book. We provide free audiobooks, key insights, summaries and brief study notes on the concepts of the books. So make sure to subscribe and become a part of our family. Without wasting any second let's dive into the ocean of words. This is Audible. Unlimited Memory. How to use advanced learning strategies to learn faster, remember more and be more productive. Written by Grandmaster Kevin Horsley. Copyright 2013-2014 by Kevin Horsley. All rights reserved. Published by TCK Publishing. TCKPublishing.com Narrated by Dan Colhane. Audiobook production by Archangel Inc. Note to listener. Using visualization can help improve your memory. That's why this audiobook comes with a free PDF companion document, including all the pictures, charts, and visual information that are included in the print and ebook versions of this book. You should receive a free copy of this PDF companion document wherever you purchase this audiobook. If you did not receive the PDF companion document, you can download it for free from my website at www.supermemory.co.za slash audiobook. Memory is a way of holding on to the things you love, the things you are, the things you never want to lose. That's a quote from The Wonder Years. Chapter 1. Introduction. Here's a quote from Brian Tracy. The great breakthrough in your life comes when you realize that you can learn anything you need to learn to accomplish any goal that you set for yourself. This means there are no limits on what you can be, have, or do. What would your life be like if you could learn and remember information easily, quickly, and effectively? Think about it. In this audiobook, I'll provide you with a set of powerful memory-enhancing mindsets and skills which will allow you to take control of your learning in your life. You'll discover many amazing methods, both ancient and new, that have been modeled from the world's best minds in the areas of accelerated learning and memory development. This book will give you information that school forgot to teach you. The approach is all about running your own brain. I believe that this can only be possible with the foundation of memory. Imagine if you were born without a memory. Who would you be? You'd be nothing. If you didn't have a memory, you don't have anything else. If I ask you, who are you? You would immediately start rearranging memories in your mind to answer that question. Your memory is the glue that binds your life together. Everything you are today is because of your amazing memory. You are a data-collecting being, and your memory is where your life has lived. If you didn't have a memory, you wouldn't be able to learn, think, have intelligence, create, or even know how to tie your shoes. You wouldn't be able to build experience in any field because experience is just a collection of memories after all. Only if you can remember information can you live it. Over the years, memory has been given a bad name. It's been associated with rote learning and cramming information into your brain. Educators have said that understanding is the key to learning, but how can you understand something if you can't remember it? We've all had this experience. We recognize and understand information, but can't recall it when we need it. For example, how many jokes do you know? You've probably heard thousands, but you can only recall about four or five right now. There's a big difference between remembering your four jokes and recognizing or understanding thousands. Understanding doesn't create use. Only when you can instantly recall what you understand and practice using your remembered understanding do you achieve mastery. Memory means storing what you've learned. Otherwise, why would we bother learning in the first place? Some people say you don't need a good memory in the Google age. Ken Jennings said, When you make a decision, you need facts. If those facts are in your brain, they're at your fingertips. If they're all in Google somewhere, you may not make the right decision on the spur of the moment. Which raises the question, Would or have you hired a person for his or her ability to Google information? No. You want people with information and experience at their fingertips. You want confident people, people that are certain about what they know. Not storing information in your mind is expensive and can lead to embarrassment and poor judgment. If you have to continually refer to notes or manuals to do your work, you'll waste time and look unprofessional. Would you rather buy a product from someone that forgets your name or from someone that remembers it? 
Would you allow a doctor to operate on you if she had to continually refer to a manual or an iPad? Definitely not. Memory is the cornerstone of our existence. It determines the quality of our decisions and therefore our entire life. Learning and memory are the two most magical properties of the human mind. Learning is the ability to acquire new information, and memory holds that new information in place over time. Memory is the foundation to all learning. If memory is not set in place, all you're doing is throwing information into a deep hole, never to be used again. The problem is that many people are not recalling what they know, and they are constantly learning and forgetting, and learning and forgetting, and learning and forgetting. When you improve your memory, you improve everything. You can access information more quickly and more easily, creating greater opportunities for connections and associations. The more facts and memories that you have properly stored in your brain, the more potential you have to make unique combinations and connections. An increased memory also enhances basic intelligence, because intelligence is based on all of the events, people, and facts that you can recall. The more you remember, the more you can create and do, because factual knowledge always precedes skill. Information can only be built into more information, so the more you know, the easier it is to get to know more. Now, with your memory, you have two choices. The first choice is that your memory cannot be improved. You can do nothing to make any difference to your inborn ability. Many people choose this as their life's choice because, through the thousands of hours of schooling, not one hour is spent on showing you how your amazing memory can be made better. School never told you anything about your amazing brain. When I was eight years old, a school psychologist gave me a bit of advice about my brain. He said I may have a form of brain damage, and he wanted to send me to a special class. I was a classic dyslexic. I wasn't born with a good memory, and I couldn't concentrate. Reading and writing were always a challenge for me. Throughout my school career, I learned by having my mother and friends read the syllabus to me. I forced myself to memorize it, and what I didn't get, which was most of it, I just didn't get. I had no future because I just couldn't grasp what was being taught to me. In twelve years of school, I couldn't read a book from cover to cover alone, and in my final year of school, I still couldn't read much better than when I started out in first grade. To cut a long story short, I somehow managed to graduate from high school in 1989. A couple of years later, my life was changed when I was walking through a local bookstore. Up until that point, I had not read a book from cover to cover by myself, but that night I decided to buy three books. They were all written by Tony Buzan. The first book was "Use Your Head," the second "Use Your Memory," and the third, the speed reading book. Back then, I honestly thought I would begin with the speed reading book and then read the other two quickly. However, it didn't work out that way. I started reading "Use Your Memory" and discovered that we all have a second choice. This choice is our memory is just a habit, and habits can be improved with the right kind of training and practice. I discovered that there are basic fundamentals to memory improvement, and that if we apply them consistently, we'll get the same results that great memory masters do. If we don't, we won't. I started studying psychology and anything I could get my hands on in the areas of the brain, mind, and memory. I studied hundreds of books and tapes, and I also interviewed people with great memories. Through this long journey, I overcame all of my dyslexic issues and took myself to a point where I was reading and taking in, on average, four books a week. I could learn in an hour what took the average person months to master. In 1995, I decided to compete in the World Memory Championships. This is an event that attracts the best memory masters from around the world, and the competition tests every facet of memory. That year, I managed to come fifth overall, having won second place in the written word event. This was proof that I had overcome all of my dyslexic challenges. I was also awarded the title International Grand Master of Memory by the Brain Trust, a title which was presented and jointly sanctioned by His Serene Highness Prince Philip of Liechtenstein on October 26, 1995, at Hanbury Manor in Ware, Hertfordshire, England. Considering my past difficulties and from where I had come, this was a great achievement. From that day on, I knew my life had changed direction, and it would never be the same again. In 1999, I decided to stretch myself and test my abilities even more. When I broke the world record that has been called the Everest of memory tests, I memorized the first 10,000 digits of pi. Pi has passed every test of randomness and has no known limit. 
The first 10,000 digits of pi are divided into 2,000 five-digit groups. The testers would randomly call out any one of these five-digit sequences, and I had to reply with the five-digit number on either side of the number chosen. This happened 50 times. The record was for the time taken to complete the test. I broke the previous record by 14 minutes. Why did I do it, you ask? Mainly because people said it was impossible to do. And that's what my life is all about, breaking limitations and showing people what our memories are capable of. Ever since then, I've been training, teaching, and coaching people to remember key information that they need for their lives and that the joy of learning is available to all of us. Many people say I have a photographic memory, but that's not true. I've just discovered many secrets about memory, and I've been able to use and make these methods my own. Now, I didn't tell you all this to impress you, but to impress the point that every person has the same potential to master his or her memory. It doesn't matter where you come from. All that matters is where you're going. However, if you keep on doing what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. You need to do different to get different. Thus, a word of warning. Mastering your memory is going to require a different kind of thinking. Don't judge or look for perfection from this book. Rather, look for value. When you judge information, you stop yourself from learning it. You can judge the methods. You can criticize them. You can try another approach. But I promise you, you will not be able to get the same results as us memory masters without applying these principles. I ask you to listen with an open mind. I have no doubt that everything that you will learn in this book works and works amazingly well. The methods that I'll share with you are the same methods that memory masters use. This is the strategy. This book is broken up into three sections covering the four keys, or C's, to improving your memory. The first section talks about improving your concentration. The second section is about improving your ability to create imagery and connecting concepts together. And the final key is about creating a habit with continuous use. These four C's are the solution to any memory problem that you have or will face in the future. Some of the examples that I have used in this book come from personal development and business books. So not only will you learn to improve your memory, but you'll also learn some key concepts that you can use for your personal development. I'll teach you to transform bland information into something that is real and well-organized. This, in turn, means the information has meaning and will then be used instead of being discarded. I'm not talking about rote learning, but a way to store information differently with far better results. The goal is to improve learning and understanding. There are many books out there that do a lot of talking before you find any meat. This book is different. I want to get straight to the point and save you a lot of time and energy. It's my goal to show you the wonderful world of memory improvement in a way I wish someone would have taught me. Don't just read this book. Play with the concepts and make it part of your thinking and your life. If you're ready, then let's go to the first lesson and unleash the power of your memory. Part 1. Concentrate The best advice I ever came across on the subject of concentration is, wherever you are, be there. That's a quote from Jim Rohn. Chapter 2. Excuse Me It begins with a quote from Zig Ziglar. You cannot fly with the eagles if you continue to scratch with the turkeys. Before we begin, what excuses are you going to make for not listening to this whole book? If you decide to listen to the whole book, what excuses are you going to make for not using the information that you're going to learn? I know you don't know what you'll be learning, but you have those excuses all lined up, don't you? Take time to really think about your excuses or write them down. These are the same excuses that you use every time to stop yourself from learning anything new. You can have success or excuses, but you can't have them both. People that learn quickly only focus on the information and skills that matter. Excuses don't matter, and they're thought viruses. The only things that are keeping you from getting what you want in your life are the excuses you keep telling yourself. Who would you be without your excuses? Think about it. Every excuse you accept makes you weaker. Excuses stop you from concentrating and paying attention. When you excuse yourself from learning something new, you block your focus and your energy. Always remember that where your attention goes, your energy flows. Some of the most common excuses that people use to give away their power are, number one, I'm helpless. I'm not smart enough. But it's not my nature. 
I don't have the time to practice the information. Time is always there. You just need to schedule it. I don't have the right genes to have a good memory. Well, how do you really know that? I'm getting older. I can't do anything about my memory. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, then it's a good thing you're not a dog. Number two is someone else is to blame. My parents always said that I was stupid. I need support to develop these skills. It's the book's fault. I need to experience it in a seminar. It's impossible to have a negative emotion without blaming someone or something. Free your mind. You always have two choices with your life and experience. You can either learn from it or you can place blame. The choice is always yours. Number three, too much stress. There's just too much to learn. I have to change my way of thinking. The book requires me to do too much. It'll be difficult. We excuse ourselves into living mediocre lives. We explain why we can't do this or that. We excuse ourselves from taking responsibility. Decide now to stop giving away your power to your excuses. Are your excuses true? Are you one hundred percent certain that they're true? Do any of your excuses really enhance and empower your life? You're more than your excuses, aren't you? Drop them now. Richard Bach said, "Argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours. The only cause for not doing something with the information in this book is you. Nobody else but you. You are responsible for your learning. The person that has the most to do with what happens to you is you. If you believe your limits, your life will be very limited. Improving your memory and concentration is not only about what you need to do more of." It's also about what you need to do less of. It's amazing how quickly you can learn a new skill when you decide to let go of your excuses, judgments, and complaints. If you consistently change your approach and increase your desire to learn this information, you'll master it. Take action now. Number one, if you continue to hold on to your excuses, what would your life be like five years from now? Two, who would you be without your excuses? Enter all learning with this new mindset. Number three, remember they are just excuses. It's not the truth. Change them now. Number four, what is more important to you: excusing yourself from experiencing your potential, or being the best that you can be? And number five, why is it important for you to learn to empower your memory? Think about it, and write down as many reasons as you can to create a big why. As Darren Hardy says, we need why power, not will power. Chapter Three: Never Believe a Lie. The mind is the limit. As long as the mind can envision the fact that you can do something, you can do it. As long as you believe one hundred percent. That's a quote from Arnold Schwarzenegger. There was once a fish that lived in a pond. One day he met another fish that used to live in the sea. The pond fish asked, "What's the sea?" And the sea fish said. It's this vast amount of water that's a million, million times bigger than your pond. The pond fish never talked to the sea fish again because he thought the sea fish was a liar. What can we learn from this? Your beliefs of what your concentration and memory can do may be your own limited version of the truth. Many people never get a taste of their true potential because they have decided to entertain only a limited view of what they can do. What if your negative beliefs about your concentration? Your memory and your potential were not true at all. Who would you be without these beliefs? Richard Bandler said, "Beliefs aren't about truth. Beliefs are about believing. They're guides for our behavior. We always defend what we believe. If you believe you have a bad memory, you'll always act and think in accordance with that belief. Where your attention goes, your energy flows. If you want to improve your memory and concentration, you need to create a belief system that supports them." Imagine there's an Earth one and an Earth two. The planets are the same in every way, but they're in different dimensions. On Earth one lives Mr. A, and on Earth two lives Mr. B. They look the same. They speak the same way. They live in the same environment. They have the same education, and they even have the same brain and nervous system. Everything is the same. There is only one thing that separates them. Mr. A believes that he has a terrible memory. He always tells people. My attention's all over the place. It's like a kangaroo hopping around in my mind. I'm always forgetting things. I'm terrible with names. My memory is getting worse every day. My memory's full. My memory's like a sieve. I'm stupid. Your brain will fill up, so don't learn too much. Mister A hates learning. 
He's not interested in remembering because he thinks he'll forget. Mr. B believes he has a wonderful memory, in fact, an exceptional memory. He always says, I choose to focus my attention. It's like a laser beam. Memory improvement is important. Look how much I remember. I have quadrillions of memories stored in my mind. My memory is getting better and better every day. I'm interested in remembering names. I'm brilliant. My memory has the ability to store and recall mountains of information. It's the only container with this characteristic. The more I put into it, the more it'll hold. Mr. B loves learning. He wants to remember and train his mind. Now, who do you think will have the better memory? Of course, Mr. B. The only difference between Mr. A and Mr. B is their beliefs. Whose beliefs do you think are right? The answer is that they're both right. It's only our thinking that makes things right or wrong. Mr. A and Mr. B both have beliefs, and they both have experiences or thoughts to back it up. The only difference is that Mr. A's focus is negative and disempowering. He sets himself up to fail. Mr. B's focus is positive and empowering. He sets himself up for success. Both Mr. A and Mr. B choose their own beliefs. It isn't an outside influence that determines their outcome. We all have the freedom to choose what we focus on. And in the end, it will determine the beliefs we carry around with us. A belief is a sense of being certain, and what you believe, you become. Negative beliefs and thoughts place a block on your concentration and memory. Unless you decide to take responsibility and change the thoughts that you're constantly feeding yourself, you will not be able to break through your negative conditioning. Every single thought we have is creative. It has the power to build and the power to destroy. Most people don't realize that when they use doubtful phrases, they're setting standards for themselves. These standards become expectations, and in the end will become self-fulfilling prophecies. Here's an example of what happens with a negative belief frame. You'll start with something like, I'm terrible with names. Then an expert says, here's the best method to improve your memory for names. You then say, sorry, it doesn't work for me. Well, why not? Well, because I told you I'm terrible with names. Your limiting belief will keep you trapped in a loop. Your mind will keep looping and prevent you from learning anything new. Your beliefs either move you or stop you. In brief, every thought and every word works for you or against you. And every thought that you confirm to be true multiplies and becomes a belief. When you change a belief, you change a mental construction. And therefore, your life. In other words, we believe what we've been taught to believe. And we don't question beliefs because we don't want to question the source. Begin to ask yourself, who will I be doubting by changing my beliefs about my mind, concentration, and memory? And why do I think this is true? People tend to think that their beliefs are absolutely true, but these beliefs are only true for them. Just because you can't do something well doesn't mean it's impossible. Identify your self-limiting beliefs and then ask, what if they were not true at all? And remember the limits in your belief system will always stop you from seeing any alternatives that should be obvious. If you choose to change your beliefs, here's how you can do it. First, 80% of changing anything is about why you want to change. And only 20% is about how you do it. Take responsibility. It's as simple as having a reason and making a decision that you want to change your beliefs. Second, question the belief. There are some things that you previously believed with all your heart, but now you don't believe them. Why? Because you question them. If, long ago, some teacher told you that you have a memory like a sieve, it doesn't mean you have to make the teacher's words true or a reality. You were younger then, had less experience, and did not have the ability to question authority. Now, with age comes the advantage that you can question his or her judgment of your younger self. Ask yourself questions like, how much is this belief going to cost me if I hold on to it? Do I have to hold on to it? Is it true? Can I be 100% certain that it is the truth? Third, create a new belief and think of experiences, research, and thoughts to confirm it. When you change your beliefs, you allow yourself to experience more of your potential and create new possibilities. Fourth, use the new belief often and make it part of your identity. Your beliefs are only the stories that you've accepted to be true about yourself. Just decide to change the stories. Spencer Lord said, Beliefs are not tattoos, they're just like clothes. You can put them on and take them off at will. Thus, here are five core beliefs that you can put on right now. Number one, I was born with exceptional concentration and memory. You are already all you need to be. 
Maxwell Maltz said, Do not tolerate for a minute the idea that you are prohibited from any achievement by the absence of inborn talent or ability. This is a lie of the grandest order, an excuse of the saddest kind. You don't need anything more. You don't need a special talent or pill to have brilliant concentration or a great memory. All you need is a willingness to learn, a method, and self-discipline. Number two, memory improvement is important. Successful people believe that what they do is important and worth doing. With this belief, people move from interest into commitment. Consider living without your memory for one week. You wouldn't be capable of doing anything. Everything you do, say, and understand is due to memory. It's your most important mental function. And if you improve it, you'll improve your life. Number three, I have incredible abilities. My memory is unlimited. Think about how much data you already have stored in your memory. Numbers, stories, jokes, experiences, words, names, and places. Think about what an incredible memory you need to just have a conversation. You have to listen, create meaning from what you've just heard, and then search your memory for a response. Not even all the computers in existence connected to each other can perform such a feat. You'll see your incredible ability once you have learned the memory methods. Number four, there is no failure, only feedback. Catch your memory doing things right. One of the best ways to strengthen this belief is to ask yourself, How does my memory serve me? How did it serve me today? Generally, people only focus on where their memory went wrong, therefore making it weaker. Focus on your strengths and change your approach when the feedback or result is not what you want. And number five, I don't know it all. Thinking you know everything there is to know about something is really not a useful place to be because it prevents you from learning anything new. Listen and become interested in other points of view, and embrace change as well as new things. Allow information to come to you. Open all channels to receive information. Decide now that you will only feed your mind with good. Adopt and try on as many empowering beliefs as you can. Use them, and watch your life take on a new direction. Take action now. Identify your self-limiting beliefs. Question these beliefs and ask yourself, Is it I can't improve my concentration and memory? Or is it I won't make the time to improve my concentration and memory? What else do you believe about your mind and your potential? Memorize this quote by Jim Rohn. If you don't like how things are, change it. You're not a tree. Chapter 4. Be Here Now Concentrate all your thoughts on the task at hand. The sun's rays do not burn until brought to a focus. Alexander Graham Bell we are all gifted, gifted with the power to think about our thinking. You can focus your thinking to improve any area of your life. You're in control of what you choose to attend to. You can continue to allow your attention to be pulled by your environment, or you can decide now to direct it. Many people believe super-concentration is a magical state with which only a lucky few are born. For instance, do you agree with this statement? Big muscular biceps are something you're born with? No, of course not because we all know it takes many hours of training in a gym. Yet people look at attention as something you have or don't have. Concentration, like anything in life, takes practice. Concentration is made up of many small choices consistently practiced. Every day, brain research is telling us that the brain is consistently changing when we learn something new. The people that limit their attention are still using the your-brain-can't-change model. We know that concentration can and should be improved. You have everything in you now to take control of your bouncing monkey mind and to take your power back. Here's the average person's daily attention training. They wake up in the morning, not peacefully, usually to some loud song or blurring alarm clock. They check their mobile phone for any messages just to see if anyone missed them. Then they jump out of bed and into the shower, and there they think about 110 things that they need to worry about or need to do. Unfortunately, they haven't allowed themselves enough time to get ready and can only manage a small, unhealthy breakfast and fill up with coffee. They get in their car, put the radio on, make phone calls, or even try to text message into traffic. They get all angry, and they get all worked up about the traffic. The traffic is there and won't change. Yet, they think it should change. In fact, we worry and focus our attention on a million things which can all wait for the appropriate time. But we allow our attention to be pulled in different directions. Imagine your attention was an Olympic athlete. Would your athlete be able to be competitive? 
The reason our attention and focus isn't that great is because we haven't trained it. We keep on switching through the channels of our mind and never stop long enough on one specific channel. We pay attention half-heartedly on almost everything we do these days. We live in an activity illusion and think that busyness is equal to good business. Busyness may make you feel good and make you think that you're more productive, but when we look back at the end of the day, we realize we haven't done anything worthwhile. We are training our minds to have continuous partial attention, and our attention is being fragmented. Training your concentration isn't that hard. You just have to learn to become more peaceful and find the moment. You have to learn to be here, now. When you're at work, be at work. When you're at home, be at home. Learn to be silent. Let your quiet mind listen and absorb, said Pythagoras. We fill our minds up with all kinds of conflict, and this takes us away from the moment. Have you ever had a fight with someone at home, then go to work, and the whole day you can't concentrate? Conflict pulls your mind in many directions. When you fill your mind with conflict, your mind will be all over the place. Conflict is the opposite of concentration. When you're peaceful, you enjoy the moment, and your mind becomes like a laser beam. Peace and concentration are the same thing. There are four areas that you need to focus on to eliminate conflict and create more peace in your mind. Number one, take control of your inner voice. Do you have a little voice that talks to you in your head? If you're not sure, you're probably asking yourself, do I have a little voice or don't I? We all have a little voice, and it has a huge influence on our concentration and our lives. You're constantly talking to yourself, but the only problem is that you catch yourself doing things wrong. Start to catch yourself doing more things right. How or where did you concentrate well today? In what area of your life do you need to stop beating yourself up? Your inner voice has the ability to offer instructions, so instruct yourself well. It's the center of your focus of control that helps you explain and make sense of your world. Don't agree with the wrong voices. All self-hatred and conflict is just a thought or a little voice. So change the thought. It's not set in stone. Remember, if you give yourself bad commands, then bad things will happen. Number two, stop multitasking. We destroy our concentration by multitasking the moment and our peace away. Multitasking is a myth. If you watch a lioness hunting in the wild, she'll focus on one wildebeest. She never focuses on two, because she knows the odds of missing both are stacked against her. She is single-minded and does everything in her power to achieve her goal. In the circus, when they train lions, they put a chair in front of their face to control their behavior. This confuses the lion and divides their attention. Now they have four chair legs to focus on, and they go into a type of trance. We humans are the same. Our brain can really only focus on one thing at a time. It's impossible to focus on two things at the same time. When you are multitasking, you're actually switching between tasks. You're always semi-attending, and it's not very effective. We cannot do more than one thing well at a time. It has become one of the most damaging myths out there. We are training our brains to have an attention deficit. A lot of people cannot focus for an extended period of time anymore. I've heard that the average person looks at their mobile phone about 50 times a day. We're reading emails, the news, Facebook, Twitter, etc. During what should be family and relationship time. People these days even drive while talking on a phone. Driving with a mobile phone makes you hit the brakes a half a second slower. If you're traveling at 112 kilometers per hour, in one half second you travel 15 and a half meters. Well, a lot can happen over that distance. If you're distracted in your car, you have a nine times higher chance of having an accident. When your phone rings, you don't have to pick it up. That's why voicemail was invented. Neuroscience consultant Marilee Springer says, Multitasking is known to slow people down by 50% and add 50% more mistakes. Multitasking is like putting your brain on drugs. There's a whole body of research that shows that multitasking is less productive, makes you less creative and contributes to you making bad decisions. We are also not allowing ourselves to sit and enjoy the moment anymore. Blaise Pascal said, All man's miseries derive from not being able to sit quietly in a room alone. We get in the car, and we have to put the radio on. When we arrive home, we have to put the TV on. When we watch TV, we flip through the channels. We even lack enough attention to watch the commercials. We are constantly filling our minds with conflict. Most people allow their attention to be pulled in different directions. Very few people direct their attention. 
A lack of attention direction is the real disorder. Stop overwhelming yourself by continually changing the channels of your mind. Sharpen up your intellect by returning to the habit of doing one thing at a time. Rediscover the value of consecutive tasking. Instead of settling for the quality dilution associated with simultaneous tasking, exceptional work is always associated with periods of deep concentration. Nothing excellent ever comes from a scattered effort. When you're all there, your brain power and resources will be all there too. Number three, know what you want. When people approach information, they never really know what they want out of it. They don't direct their minds. Learn to engage and be present with the information by creating a strong pick in your mind. P I C. That stands for purpose, interest, and curiosity. Purpose. Having a clear purpose is important because clarity dissolves resistance. Always remember why you're reading or learning the information. Keep your purpose at the forefront of your mind. If you don't know what you want, how are you going to know when you get it? Learning with a purpose increases your attention, comprehension, retention, and organizes your thoughts. The more specific the purpose, the more information you'll get. A vague purpose would be, I want to learn more about memory from this book. A specific purpose would be. I want to learn at least six key strategies that will enable me to improve my memory. Focus on getting information that you can use, and then put it into practice. As David Allen said, "If you're not sure why you're doing something, you can never do enough of it." The eyes for interest. Your level of interest sets the direction of your attention, and therefore your level of focus. If you're not interested, remembering what you read will be almost impossible. Whatever is highest on your interest level is where your mind is alert, disciplined, and focused. Whatever is lower on your interest list is where you hesitate and procrastinate. You can remember mountains of information when you're interested in the subject. It almost feels automatic, and your concentration is at its peak. Your deficits of attention are mostly interest deficits. Your mind never wanders away; it only moves towards more interesting and outstanding things. We all know that interest improves concentration, but how do we get interested in the boring information? The first step is to find your interests, and then to find links or connections between your interests and the new information that you're learning. For example, I'm interested in training and sharing knowledge with other people. When I read anything, I'm always searching for new information relating to my interest. When I read or listen through my interest filter, I'm focused and can concentrate. I always ask myself questions like. How does this connect to training? How is it going to improve my life? If I read or remember this, is it going to give me something that not many people know? Is it going to help me in the future? How does this material help me achieve my goals? In other words, all boring information can be made more interesting with the right mindset. Gilbert Chesterton said, "There are no uninteresting things, only uninterested people." So get interested. The final part of pick. And getting your mind more involved is curiosity. Questions are the answer to improving curiosity. Before you start reading or learning anything, ask yourself motivational questions. Most people ask questions that don't move them to take action. They look at the book and say things like, "Why do I have to read this book? This is too much to read. This looks really boring." If you ask questions like that, how much energy are you going to have to learn? You want to ask energy-enhancing questions that get you engaged in the information. Ask yourself, how is this relevant and applicable to my life right now? How will this information help me achieve my goals? How can I apply this information to improve my work? How will this help me? How will this information make me more significant? Get curious about your mind and how it works. Tony Robbins says, if you want to cure boredom, be curious. If you're curious, nothing is a chore; it's automatic. You want to study, cultivate curiosity, and life becomes an unending study of joy. And the last way to create more peace is to number four, eliminate worry. Imagine one day you woke up and you didn't have to worry. What would you feel like? You'd be peaceful. There'd be no thoughts moving through your mind, no thoughts sending stress emotions through your system. Imagine waking up and you didn't have to run or control other people's behaviors or control the government with your thinking. Imagine you didn't have to believe the latest fear rumor. Byron Katie says, "I could only find three kinds of business in the world: mine, yours, and God's. Whose business are you in? You become more relaxed when you decide to take up residence in your own mind and your own business. 
Life is easy when you simplify and make peace with your train of thought. When you believe your bad thinking, you suffer. How many people, events, and things did you try to control with your mind today? Stay in your own mind and enjoy the laser-like energy of having a clear mind. You don't worry because you care. You worry because that's what you have learned to do. Worry is a very creative mental process. The questions you ask in your mind create your worries. If you ask what-if questions, you set your mind up to worry. If you consistently ask, what if I lose my job? What if I crash my car? What if criminals attack me? All these what-if phrases create movies in your mind that consistently loop different scenarios, which creates a state of worry. Rather, say to yourself, what would I do if I lost my job? What would I do if I crashed my car? These movies that are created by these questions don't loop you into worry. They give you action steps that direct your mind. Create a procedure for different scenarios and make peace with your thinking. Learn to practice peace, because if you have no attention, you have no retention. Most people swing from one emotional extreme to the other. Concentration is about learning how to stay centered. When you concentrate your power, you can achieve anything. Imagine your mind was a torch. Most people allow their torch to jump and shine all over the place. You want your torch to stand still and shine brightly. Nothing outside of you is going to fix your concentration. It's an inside job. You need to make a decision today. Do you want to improve your concentration, or don't you? It's always up to you. Therefore, eliminate your excuses, clean up your beliefs, and be here now. Part 2. Create and Connect When you train your creativity, you automatically train your memory. When you train your memory, you automatically train your creative thinking skills. That's a quote from Tony Buzan. And it begins Chapter 5. Bring Information to Life. Another quote from Mark Victor Hansen. Your mind is the greatest home entertainment center ever created. Many people dream of having a photographic memory. They define it as the ability to take a quick mental picture of information, without effort, and then describe it in detail from memory. In this case, your mind would be like a camera taking photos of anything you need to know. Unfortunately, all perfect memory takes some conscious effort, and photographic memory is a myth. Memory is a creative process and not a photographic process. Many people who are thought to have a photographic memory are just using all the methods that you'll learn in this book on some or other level. If you take these methods into your life, you'll be tapping into your natural memory power too. Perfect memory is a skill and not some special gift. Have you ever had this experience? You're in an exam, and you know exactly what page the information is on, but you don't know what is on the page. Or you're reading something, and you get to the bottom of the page, and you think to yourself, what have I just read? The reason this happens is because you never brought the information to life. Think about it. What happens when you read a novel or a story? You make a kind of movie in your mind, don't you? You can remember all the names of the characters, places, and events because you can see it, and you're creating pictures all the time while reading. You're using your imagination and your natural creative ability. However, when people start to learn textbook material, they try to make a mental photograph a recording of the page, but leave their creative abilities out of the learning process. People that learn quickly or have a so-called photographic memory apply their creativity to everything they learn. They may have either learned how to do this in the past or they've been using the principles naturally and unconsciously. Most people try to remember information with their sense of sound. They repeat the information over and over again, hoping it will somehow stick. Sound is very limited because it doesn't attach easily to other memories. A sound is also always sequential. If you want to remember something with sound, you have to start at the beginning and work your way through the information. However, when you see information as an image in your mind, you can jump in and out of the information, and therefore improve your understanding, too. Any book that you really enjoy normally activates your imagination and brings the information to life. You naturally get engaged in the book and you battle to put it down because you don't want to turn the movie off. Your mind is like an internal movie screen on which you can ask it to produce information. This is how we think and learn effectively. Your brain creates miracles every day by converting lifeless information into pictures and ideas. 
When you become aware of this, every word becomes a picture drawn with letters, because words are only symbols of three-dimensional images. Arthur Gordon said, Isn't it amazing how we take them for granted? Those little black marks on paper, 26 different shapes known as letters, arranged in endless combinations known as words, lifeless, until someone's eyes fall on them. If your brain was unable to make images out of symbols, all learning and reading would be worthless and incredibly boring. Your brain likes pictures, and we are really good at remembering them. As neuroscientist John Medina says, Hear a piece of information, and three days later you'll remember 10% of it. Add a picture, and you'll remember 65%. Some people say, I can't make pictures in my mind. We all make pictures in our mind. If you were unable to create or remember visual images, you'd be severely handicapped. Learn to use your imagination. It's a learned skill and not a natural talent. Reading and understanding is also a creative imagination process. It's a power that can be compared to magic. We succeed in this area when we produce images in our mind. When we don't, we feel confused or ignorant. If I tried to explain to you how a car engine works, but you don't know what an engine looks like, or if I didn't have one for you to look at or a drawing to represent it, it would be really difficult to understand. The more we turn information into images or mind movies, the more we'll remember and comprehend. We can learn to make all our learning more creative and memorable if we use our unlimited imagination. You can learn to enhance your memory imagination system by making your mind movies exciting and sticky. The way to do this is with the C principle. The C principle stands for senses, exaggeration, and energize. Use your S. Senses. There are only five ways to get anything into your brain, and that's through sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. When you utilize your senses, you experience more of life and you remember more. Our senses help us mentally recreate our world. If you train your senses, you'll be using more of your brain. And if you learn to engage as many of your senses as you can, then you'll automatically improve your memory. Think of a horse. See it in your mind. Touch it. Smell it. Hear it even taste it. You didn't see the letters H-O-R-S-E in your mind. You saw a multi-sensory picture of what the word represents. Your senses make mind movies real and memorable. Use them. The E is for exaggeration. What's easier to remember, a strawberry that's normal size or one the size of a house? Make your images larger or smaller than life. What's more memorable, an elephant or an elephant wearing a pink bikini? Exaggerate with humor. Tickle your mind. There's no scientific evidence to prove that learning should be serious. Make your images illogical. Have fun. Create some positive, exaggerated learning memories. And the other E in C is for energize. Give your pictures action. Would you rather watch a movie of your holiday or a slideshow? What creates more feeling in your imagination? A horse standing still or a horse that's running and moving? Make your information vivid, colorful, and not boring, flat, and black and white. Use action. It brings life to your memories. Make your images act in illogical ways. You can weave, crash, stick, or wrap things together. We can make things talk, sing, and dance. Think about the great genius Walt Disney. The process of imagination is a fun, creative process. The more enjoyment you can put into it, the better. When you're reading or hearing something, focus on all the C principles and imagine it as a movie. Even if you don't use a specific method that you'll learn in this book, the C principles will improve your concentration. Emil Q pointed out that when the imagination and the will are in conflict, the imagination always wins. If you will yourself to remember and your imagination is not on the task, you'll have zero retention and recall. Your imagination is the place of all your memory power. Some people say, this is not the way that I naturally think. This is not the way that I naturally think either. This is how I've taught myself to think, because it works. The more skilled you become in using your imagination, the more you can know, comprehend, and create. In this way, you become the director of your own mind. How do I turn abstract information into images? We remember nouns and adjectives with ease because they have meaning, and we can make a mental picture without much effort. Most abstract words can be made to mean something. Just use a meaningful thought or word to represent a meaningless word. Find a word or phrase that sounds the same or similar to the abstract word, or you can break a word up into its individual sounds. Imagine you had to remember the name Washington. 
You could turn that word into a picture of you washing a tin. Or if you had to remember the word hydrogen, you could use a picture of a fire hydrant drinking gin. You can turn all complex information into something meaningful and memorable by turning it into images. In the beginning, it'll take a bit of effort on your part. You'll have to invest your attention at first, and then it'll become a habit. To practice, look at words, break them up, make a picture, and give it all more meaning. Let's learn a few foreign words for practice. Really imagine each word and create a C mini mind movie. First, we'll use Spanish words. Tiger is tigre. It sounds like tea gray. Imagine a tiger drinking his tea that is turned gray. Sun is soul. Imagine that the sun is burning the sole of your one foot. Arm is brazo. Imagine a bra is sewn into your arm. Some Italian words. Chicken is polo. You can imagine playing polo with a chicken instead of a ball. Cat is gato. Imagine to your friend, you've got to hold my cat. Some French words. Book is libre. Sounds like liver, so you can imagine opening a book and finding squashed liver inside. Hand is main. My main hand is my right hand. Chair is share. Imagine you have chairs in a chair. Some Zulu words. Dog is inja. Think of an injured dog. Floor is pansy. Imagine a pansy growing out of the floor. Snake is inyoka. Imagine a snake slithering in your car. Some Japanese words. Chest is mune. Imagine money growing out of your chest. Door is toe. Imagine you're kicking the door with your big toe. Carpet is jutan. Imagine you are tanning on a big carpet, or you tan on a carpet. Test yourself. What's the Spanish word for tiger? What's the Italian word for cat? What's the Zulu word for dog? What's the Japanese word for chest? What is the French word for book? The Italian word for chicken. What's the Zulu word for snake? The French word for hand. What's the Japanese word for carpet? Just by connecting these words in a silly mind movie, you've learned fourteen foreign words. You can use this method to remember hundreds of foreign words if you use the C principle. Remember, you're only connecting two concepts at a time. If you imagine it for a few seconds, it'll stick in your memory, and it'll be easy to recall if you need it. You can even use this method to remember all the countries and capitals. You just need to bring the information to life. The capital of Australia is Canberra. You can imagine a kangaroo, represents Australia, eating a can of berries, Canberra, and the two will stick together to make it more memorable. The capital of Greece is Athens. Imagine eight hens, which sounds like Athens, swimming in Greece. The capital of Madagascar is Antananarivo. Imagine a mad gas car crashing into your friend Anne, who is tanning on a river. The capital of Belgium is Brussels. Imagine Brussels sprouts falling out of a bell, doing gym, Belgium. Make a silly picture and really see it, and you could remember all the capitals with ease. The greatest secret of a powerful memory is to bring information to life with your endless imagination. Take responsibility for your memory. You can only learn to control your memory when you become the source of your imagination. Memory is not a thing that happens to you. You create your memories. You can make any information into something more meaningful. When we start using the memory systems, you'll see how easy it is to convert abstract information into meaningful concepts. Using all these memory methods improves your creativity, enhances your memory, and your humor too. Chapter six: Use your car to remember. Making the simple complicated is commonplace. Making the complicated simple, awesomely simple, that's creativity. That's a quote from Charles Mingus. We have just learned to bring information to life by turning information into pictures or mind movies. Now we need to learn to create files for pictures from our long-term memory. This will assist us in remembering new information. These systems require you to think differently. I always think it's amazing how people want to improve their memory and concentration. But they do more of the same thing and expect a different result. You have to do different to become different. The method that I'll share with you now is called the car method. Our car is a great long-term storage compartment because we know it well and can easily navigate it in our mind. 
With this method, as with all of them, I want you to see the images in your mind. Remember, every word in any language is only a picture drawn with letters. Get rid of your excuses like, I'm not creative, or I don't think like this. This isn't how I think either. This is how I've trained myself to think. Because it works. These methods may seem silly, but just go with it. I promise that you'll see the point and you'll remember the information. These systems take long for me to explain, but they work at the speed of thought. The only reason it won't work for you is if you don't do it. You're going to use nouns for this exercise because they're easy to imagine and therefore easier to control and store. Then, in the second exercise and the rest of the book, we'll use more abstract information. Follow the images in your mind and let's see how much you remember. See your car in your mind and imagine you squeeze a big apple into the front grid of your car. Take a carrot and stab it into the bonnet or hood of the car. On the windscreen or windshield, see grainy bread and think to yourself, the grainy bread is going to damage my windshield wipers. Get inside your car and squash dried fruit on the dashboard. Really see it go into your speedometer. On the driver's seat, imagine you're sitting on blueberries and strawberries. Really feel it. Throw eggs at the person sitting in the passenger seat next to you. They now have egg on their face. Imagine you're pouring thousands of nuts and seeds into your back seat. Go outside your car and imagine a massive orange on your roof. You open the boot or trunk and it's full of fish. Really smell the fish. In the exhaust pipe, there's broccoli and Brussels sprouts growing out of the exhaust. And finally, the tires of your car are made out of sweet potatoes. Sweet. Go through your car from the beginning to the end and see if you can remember all the information. If a word didn't stick, go back. Make the connection stronger and see it more clearly in your mind. What you've just learned are 14 superfoods, foods that have been shown to improve your vitality and keep your mind agile and alert. Not only do you know the list forwards, but you also know it backwards and inside out. What's on the roof? What are the car tires made of? What was on the driver's seat? What was on the bonnet of the car? Your mind automatically makes the connection and answers the question for recall. Now that you really know it, it's easier to use and think about. Some people say, but now I have to remember the car, too. You're giving me more to remember. That's not true. With all of the systems, you'll be using something that's already in your memory. In fact, you're using all of the unused space in your long-term memory. You remembered the entire list and with ease. Now, why does this system work so well? If you throw water into a sieve, it goes in and straight through. If you put a packet into the sieve, the water will get trapped. Your memory works in the same way. Your long-term memory, things that are in your memory forever, like your name and what your house looks like, etc., is like the packet that can be used to trap short-term information, new information coming in, like a new telephone number. When you've managed to do that, you make a strong medium-term memory. With the car list, your whole car is in your long-term memory. Long-term memory offers you a place to store the information. The locations in the car become storage compartments for the short-term memories. All the memory methods work with my formula. Long-term memory plus short-term memory equals medium-term memory. These methods also organize information, therefore making it easier to find. The more order you put into a subject, the easier it will be to remember. The secret to accelerated learning is superior organization. We can use other cars to remember other new information, too. In the audio companion document, you'll find a picture of a car with seven images on it. It shouldn't conflict with the food car because it opens up a new memory file. Look at the picture in the companion document and make sure that you can clearly recreate the whole image in your mind. Break the images down. Look at each place and make sure that each one sticks to its place. Have you done that? Good. What you've just learned are Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. By remembering all seven images, you're creating points of reference within your mind for each of the habits. When you have it in your memory, it will be easier to gauge if you're living the seven habits. When you mentally look at the car, you'll instantly be able to recall all the information. Remember, the more you know, the easier it is to get to know more. Let me explain each of those pictures. The seven habits are as follows. Habit number one, be proactive. I thought of a bee that's a pro golfer. That picture should be enough to trigger habit number one. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. The brain is running a race and looking at the end in mind. Habit three, put first things first. The man is in first position, putting first things first. 
Habit number four: Think win-win. The two trophies show that everyone wins with win-win. Habit five: Seek first to understand, then to be understood. The man under the umbrella will stand up. Habit number six: Synergize. Sign balanced on the edge with eyes. Sharpen the saw is habit number seven on the tire of the car. With your memory, always use as few pictures as possible to remember as much as possible. The more simple and clear it is, the less you'll feel overwhelmed. You can also make the connection that the first three habits are the private victory. The front of your car is private. You're the only one that opens the bonnet of your car. Habits four, five, and six are the public victory. In the car, you allow others to get into your car. It's public. Habit seven is outside the car. The seventh habit keeps everything else in check. Remember these habits. Read the book to get more understanding and retention, and live them. As Stephen Covey said, habits can be learned and unlearned. But I also know it isn't a quick fix. It involves a process and a tremendous commitment. In this chapter, you've been able to remember 21 bits of useful information. These methods help you to organize information more clearly, and therefore you will be using more of your memory power and potential. All the methods in this book help you to store information that can be used. You can make many more storage compartments in and on your car. If you think about it, you can use every detail of your car to find at least 100 places to store new information in your memory. You can also use any other forms of transport: buses, trains, airplanes, ships, or even spaceships as storage files or compartments. Chapter seven. Use your body to remember. The music of your life is far better played with all the fingers of your multiple intelligences performing their magic on the keyboard of your existence. That's a quote from Tony Buzan. That's taken from Tony's book called Head First. In his book, he talks about how we have at least ten intelligences. We don't just have one way of being clever, but at least ten, and probably more. I like to remember these intelligences to remind myself how incredible we all are, and to focus on improving them daily. But before I get ahead of myself, let me demonstrate how to remember these intelligences with another system. It's called the body method. It's similar to the car method, but this time we are using parts of our body to store the new information. Your body is another great long-term storage compartment. You're in it every day, and you know it well. There are plenty of storage compartments that you can use, but for demonstration purposes, I'm only going to use ten places. With this method, we're going to place ten key bits of information on our body. The information is a bit more abstract, so it'll require you to think more creatively. So let's give it a go. The first place that we're going to store information on is our feet. The first intelligence is creative intelligence. So I want you to imagine that you're standing on a big bright light bulb. A light bulb always reminds me of creative ideas, and it's burning your feet. To strengthen the association, you can also imagine you're painting a beautiful work of art on your feet. On the second place, your knees. We're going to store personal intelligence. Now imagine a big purse. Sounds like personal on your knees. Create a bit of action with this picture. Imagine opening the purse on your knees, and your knees come flying out of it. Personal intelligence is about taking responsibility, so own the purse on your knees. The next storage compartment is your thighs. Here we'll store social intelligence. Imagine people having a big party, social, on your thighs. Really see the party, and feel it happening on your thighs now. The next place is your belt or hips, and we'll store spiritual intelligence there. Imagine a beautiful angel on your belt, or that the angel is buckling your belt for you. Angels remind me of spirituality. Now review all the previous images from your feet to your hips. The words are creative, personal, social, and spiritual. Next is your physical intelligence, and we'll store it on your stomach. Imagine you get physical, start doing sit-ups, and your stomach all of a sudden becomes muscular. It becomes the perfect six-pack. Imagine in your left hand your sensual intelligence. Here you can imagine a snotty nose, ears, and eyes to remind you of all your senses. Then in your right hand place sexual intelligence. Here you can make up your own picture. Now let's review quickly. We have creative, personal, social, spiritual, physical, sensual, and sexual. The next place is your mouth. Imagine big, bright, colorful numbers flying out of your mouth. 
numerical intelligence. Or you can only speak in numbers. On your nose, see a spaceship landing on your nose and forehead. Spatial intelligence. Or see a spaceship flying up your nose. Finally, on the top of your head, imagine writing words on your hair, or your hair starts talking. That's verbal intelligence. Let's review the body list. The creative and emotional intelligences. Legs create motion. That's to remind you that the creative and emotional intelligences are stored on your feet and legs. Number one, creative intelligence. Two, personal intelligence, self-knowledge, self-fulfillment, and understanding self. Three, social intelligence. And four, spiritual intelligence. The bodily intelligences, all stored on the biggest part of your body, on your torso. Number five, physical intelligence. Six, sensual intelligence. And seven, sexual intelligence. Then there are the traditional IQ intelligences, the head intelligences. Number eight, numerical intelligence. Nine, spatial intelligence. And ten, verbal intelligence. Tony Buzan says we are now entering the intelligence age, so it's vitally important that you know more about your amazing intelligences. The body method also helps you structure the information so that you can easily jump in and out of the material. When you read head first, the body list will act as a powerful memory matrix that will attract more information and improve your understanding and recognition of the content. If you hear any other list of intelligences like Howard Gardner's, you can easily slot the information into its relevant compartment. When you hear people discussing IQ, you'll also immediately know and remember that IQ only tests three intelligences: the head intelligences. Paul McKenna said, "Most of us have been taught to think that we are either intelligent or we are not, but the definitions of intelligence we learned at school were built around the specific types of intelligence that are most valued at school." Verbal intelligence and numerical intelligence. The body method was originally invented by the ancient Greeks. You can use this method to remember information for exams, work, shopping lists, or any list of information. You can even use it to remember things when you don't have a pen at hand, like when you're in the shower. I just used ten places as an example, but you can use your back, your ears, eyes, nose. You can use it all. Just make sure you connect the two in a humorous way. Remember the C principles, and that you remember the order. I've been able to use this method to remember 50 bits of information. I like to use this system to remember information so that I can consistently look at the information and have it at my fingertips. Chapter eight: Pegging information down. And we begin with a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche: "The existence of forgetting has never been proved." We only know that some things don't come to mind when we want them. Have you ever had this experience? You smell something, and instantly your memory takes you back to another time. The smell is a link to the experience. Or you hear a song, and a whole stream of memories are released from your mind. We can consciously take control of this reminder principle to create another system for our memory skills toolbox. This is the first system that I ever learned, and it introduced me to my memory potential. It worked so well that it seemed like a trick, and ever since that day, I've been hooked on the power of my memory. I hope it has a similar effect for you. It's called the peg method of memory. We're going to explore the power of your associative mind. We're going to learn two new peg methods of memory. The first is called the rhyming peg method, and the other, the shape peg method. These secrets were brought to our conscious awareness by John Sambrook and Henry Herdson in the late 1700s. These methods are very simple and effective. They will provide you with a method that can help you remember 40 or more bits of information in a short space of time. You can even remember the information in random order and by number. Let me explain the first method: the rhyming pegs. The pegs act in much the same way as clothes pegs. They keep information hanging around in your mind. The pegs themselves must become part of your long-term memory for them to work. Remember, you always need your long-term memory to assist your short-term memory. With this method, you associate new information to long-term memory pegs in your mind. The pegs also act as compartments or files for your new thoughts. The method is simple. It makes memory pegs out of rhyming words, and we'll use the following rhyming words as mental files. One rhymes with the word bun. Two, shoe. Three, tree. Four. Door, 
Five rhymes with hive. Six sticks. Seven heaven. Eight gate. Nine vine. And ten hen. Now each one of these pegs can become compartments to store new information. You link the peg using the C principle to the words that you want to remember. In Anthony Robbins' life-changing book, Awaken the Giant Within, he has a list of the ten emotions of power. I want you to use this new system so that you can hold these emotions in your mind. Think about them daily, because personal development only happens when you can remember what you need to act on. The ten emotions of power are love and warmth, appreciation and gratitude, curiosity, excitement and passion. Determination, flexibility, confidence, cheerfulness, vitality, and contribution. Remember to make the images illogical. See the information in your mind for a few seconds. Take your time and make the association strong. You can also draw an image to help you experience the information more. One bun. Imagine a heart-shaped warm bun, symbol for love. Or imagine that thousands of warm hearts are flying out of a bun. Really visualize it, and you will remember that one is love and warmth. Two shoe. Imagine that a preacher is grating a shoe with a cheese grater. I used a preacher to remind you of appreciation, and grater for gratitude. Three tree. Imagine a cat in the tree. Don't make it logical. Maybe imagine that the branches look like cats. Cats are hanging off the branches, or cats are growing out of the tree. Curiosity killed the cat. So three is curiosity. Four door. Imagine an excited person bashing down your door, or the door is so excited it jumps up and down and opens and closes. Then you squeeze passion fruit down the excited door. Four is excitement and passion. Five hive. Imagine determined bees or determined terminators trying to break open a beehive. Bees are a determined nation. Determination is five. Six sticks. Imagine hitting a flexible person that's doing the splits with a stick, or really feel how flexible the stick can be. Six is flexibility. Seven heaven. Imagine heaven is full of confident people. See them walking tall with confidence that they're in paradise. Seven is confidence. Eight gate, see a smiley face shaped gate. You cheerfully open the cheerful gate. Eight is cheerfulness. Nine vine, see vitamins growing on a vine. As you eat these vitamin grapes, you feel your sense of vitality improve. Ten hen, imagine a hen giving you presents. She's a contributing hen. Ten is contribution. Now really see each link picture in your mind, and make it clear. You should now know these emotions forwards, backwards, and in random order. Test yourself to see if you have them all. Practice feeling these emotions because you become good at what you practice. Anthony Robbins says you are the source of all your emotions. You're the one who creates them. Plant these emotions daily and watch your whole life grow with vitality that you've never dreamed of before. The rhyme method can be extended by finding more words that rhyme with the number. For example, one bun, sun. Tom, gum, and gun. With this method, you can easily create a peg system that you can use to store up to 30 bits of new information. Pegging also has no limits. You can create other lists too. Here's the second short peg list that you can use: the shape system. It converts numbers into concrete shapes. It works in the same way as the rhyme list, only this time the pegs are shaped like the number. We're not going to do an exercise with this system because you've already learned the principle in the rhyme list. Use this list on your own to remember ten bits of new information. Play with it and have a bit of fun. The shape method just gives you another option to use. You can find the list in the audio book companion document. These peg lists create so many new possibilities. You can create all kinds of peg lists. You can use any list that's already in your long-term memory. You can make up words for each letter of the alphabet. For example, apple, bucket, cat, dolphin, etc. Use any list that you already know well. Your favorite football players, superheroes, pop stars, or any list that you can remember in order. Enjoy using this method, and find new ways to improve it. Chapter nine is called "In the First Place," and we open it with a Daniel T. Willingham quote: "Whatever you think about, that's what you remember. Memory is the residue of thought." 
The system that you're about to discover is the most incredible tool you'll ever learn. It will help you grow in ways that you could never imagine. It is so simple. It has been around for 2,500 years, and yet few have harnessed its potential. You can use this system to remember any information and mountains of it. It takes practice, but once you use it, you'll never look back. This method is the original and still the most effective of all the systems. Using this system is as easy as remembering a journey. Some people think this method is too simple to work, but it works because it doesn't overwhelm you. It's the same process as the car and body list, but only this time we're using places or markers on a location, journey, or route to store information. Here's how it works. Number one, prepare in your mind an organized location. For example, a house layout, a journey, or a shopping mall. Number two, create markers or places on this location. Same as what you did with the body and car list in an easy-to-follow order. Number three, make a clear image using the C principles of the information that you'd like to remember. Number four, place each item you're trying to remember on each of the marked locations. In short, it's as simple as finding a place like a route, journey, or building in your mind to store the information. Then you store it. This system makes remembering large amounts of information as easy as remembering a trip to the nearest shop. You're using the formula again, long-term memory plus short-term memory equals medium-term memory. Let me introduce you to the journey method with a short exercise. We are going to store 12 useful principles from one of John C. Maxwell's books. I really enjoy his books because they're always very well organized and therefore making storing information easier. He normally creates a summary list of the topics that he'll cover and then he writes in more detail about each topic. You can use the systems to remember all of his lists and laws and become an expert in leadership. Once the information is in a memorable matrix, it'll start to attract more information to it. It helps long-term storage and use. When you have it in your head, it is so much easier to use because what's the use of learning information if you can't recall what you know? In his book Today Matters, he shares 12 keys that you can focus on daily to get more success and fulfillment in your life. As he says, you'll never change your life until you change something you do daily. He calls them the daily dozen. Here are the keys. Number one, attitude. Number two, priorities. Number three, health. Four, family. Five, thinking. Number six is commitment. Finances is number seven. Number eight, faith. Number nine, relationship. Generosity is number ten. Values, number eleven. And number twelve, growth. Most people will repeat the list of information over and over again and try to force it into their memory. Rote learning and constant repetition creates an aversion to learning and it's frustrating. The more you can encode information into your memory, the more effective the learning. Let's use a method to find the fun in frustration. Now all that we have to do is to focus attention and connect each thought to a place. Try this little exercise with me. I'm going to be using four rooms in my house as a journey to give you an example of how you can use this system. The rooms are compartments in my mind that I can use to store new information. Let me guide you through the house and let's store the information together. Make sure that your markers are all in an easy-to-follow order. Then review your markers to make sure you have clear storage compartments. The places must also be near each other, but nicely spaced out. Here's a mental map of four rooms in my house and 12 places that we'll use. And they are room number one, kitchen. Number one, washing machine. Number two, fridge. Number three, stove. Room two, TV room. Four, chairs. Number five, the TV. Number six, exercise bike. Room number three, bedroom. Seven, mirror. Number eight, cupboards. Number nine, bed. The last three items are in room number four, bathroom. Number ten, bath. Eleven, shower and 12, Toilet. You can see the picture in your audiobook companion document. If I gave you a box with 12 objects in it, would you be able to place it on the furniture in my house? Of course you would. Now all we do is turn the information into something tangible, like an object, and then place them in the room. We start in the kitchen. The first word is attitude. Imagine someone with a really bad attitude jumping into your washing machine. Clean up his attitude in the machine. See it. At the next place, imagine writing all of your priorities on the fridge door. Use a permanent marker and think about how your priorities are permanently stored on the fridge door. Imagine a healthy bodybuilder making an apple pie and shoving it into the stove. 
The apples are also a reminder for health. So what was in the washing machine? On the fridge? At the stove. Now we move to the TV room. The first place there is the chairs. Imagine your whole family is jumping up and down on the chairs. The more illogical the image, the more it will stick. The second place is the TV. Imagine a thought bubble coming out of the TV because it's a thinking machine. It also influences our thinking. The final place in the room is the exercise bike. So imagine combing the exercise bike. Reminds you of commitment. It's also a commitment to use the bike. In my bedroom, the first place is the mirror. And here, imagine money flying out of the mirror. Your finances are a mirror of your productivity. Whatever represents faith for you, place it inside the cupboard. Put faith on every shelf or hanger. The next word we want to place in our memory journey is relationships. And that is on the bed. Okay, you can make your own picture there. The final room is the bathroom. See a genie jumping out of the bath and he gives you what you wish. The genie giving reminds us of generosity. Imagine the shower is made out of gold, or you open the taps and gold runs out of it. Gold has great value and represents values. At the last place we imagine, a tree growing out of the toilet for growth. What was the word connected to each place? Room one, kitchen. Number one, washing machine. Number two, fridge. Number three, stove. Room two, TV room. Number four, chairs. Number five, TV. Number six, exercise bike. Room three, bedroom. Number seven, mirror. Eight, cupboards. Nine, bed. Room four, bathroom. Number ten, bath. Eleven, shower. Twelve, toilet. Excellent. That is now your first memory route or journey. And it will begin to open your mind to the possibility of having a perfect memory. You've just learned the 12 keys in John Maxwell's book, Today Matters, and it was as easy as walking around my house. You'll remember all the words if you have connected them properly. Go through it a few times and you'll know the daily dozen. You'll get better results with this method if you use your own environment because you're more aware of the order of the places. Review the list backwards and you'll notice that it will all still be there. By reviewing it backwards, you make the images clearer for your memory. If you made clear images and placed them on the route, the list will be very memorable. This method helps you to see the big picture and zoom into the details. The concepts are brought to life and become concrete. It's always easier to remember something that is experienced in your mind. We remember what we think about. Now, think about this information that you've learned. Buy Today Matters and focus on making small changes in these areas daily and remember it to live it. This journey or route method shows you what's possible. Every great memory person uses this method more than any other. It is so effective because you can make thousands of storage places. Think about how many markers you can make. We all have a brilliant memory for journeys. You've visited many places in your life. You can use buildings, museums, schools, shopping centers, and almost any location that you know. Make sure there are places you know well, that have significance for you, and they have lots of variety. You can make your routes as long as you want. You can have a place or route for every subject you're learning. Remember to have fun. This system will change the way that you learn forever. The only effort is trying to improve your ability to make images and placing it on a familiar mental journey. It'll feel like you're cheating. It's like having crib notes or a teleprompter inside your head. The journey is like the paper and the images are like the ink. Your imagination can create any information on a familiar journey. It'll change your life. You can use it to remember all kinds of information. I've helped medical students, law students, pilots, managers, and business people remember all kinds of information with this method. I used this method to store the first 10,000 digits of pi. A friend of mine, Dr. Yip Sui Chui, remembered the entire Oxford Dictionary. 1,774 pages, word for word with this method. Anyone can store an unlimited amount if they choose to spend the time. Some people say, I'll run out of space. If I gave you a truck full of objects to place in a shopping mall, would you be able to do that? Of course you would. If you look for it, you'll find thousands and thousands of places just waiting to be used in your mind. There are no limits to this system, only limits in your own thinking. The important thing is that you practice. The more you practice, the better you'll get. Linking Thoughts is the title of Chapter 10, and it begins with a quote from Louis L'Amour. He said, No memory is ever alone. It's at the end of a trail of memories, a dozen trails that each have their own associations. 
In the previous chapters, we learned to bring information to life and to store it in a long-term memory compartment system. Now, in this chapter, we are going to learn to link more thoughts together. It's a way to direct attention and to strengthen your imagination and your ability to associate concepts. Your mind is an associating machine, and it has no limits. I often hear people say, "Oh, do you learn by association?" The answer to that is, we only learn by association. Learning is connecting new information to old information. It doesn't happen any other way. It's creating a relationship between the known and the unknown. And the more you know, the easier it is to connect more information and get to know more. Now let's memorize a list together to experience this method. It'll seem silly, but stick with it, and I'll make a point. This story takes longer for me to explain than what happens in your mind. Listen to it and remember to use the S E E, the C principle. I want you to imagine that you're washing a tin. Really see it in your mind. As you wash the tin, it suddenly begins developing a huge Adam's apple. A chef and her son grab the Adam's apple and rip it out. The chef and her son decide to make some medicine, which they give to Marilyn Monroe, and she starts to develop a massive Adam's apple too. Michael Jackson sees her Adam's apple throbbing and runs away screaming and jumps into a van with beer in it. The van is being driven by a big yellow hairy son. Really see it. Make it silly, hairy, and let it stick. The hairy son doesn't drive very well and crashes into a tiler, tiling his wall. The tiler's tiles are polka dot tiles. A tailor takes the polka dots off and starts tailoring you a polka dotted suit. Now recall the story and all the key words. If you didn't get it all, listen to it again and make the link stronger. See if you can do it backwards too. What you've just learned are the first twelve presidents of the USA. You can continue remembering all forty-four presidents just by linking one thought to the next. If you have any problems recalling the list, just make it more outstanding and make the links clear. Here's that list of the first twelve presidents: number one, washing a tin, Washington; number two. Adam's apple, Adams. Number three, a chef and her son sounds like Jefferson. Number four, medicine sounds like Madison. Number five, Marilyn Monroe, Monroe. Number six, Adam's apple again, Adams. Number seven, Michael Jackson, Jackson. Number eight, a van with beer in, Van Buren. Number nine, a hairy son, Harrison. And number ten, a tiler, a person who lays tiles, for Tyler. Eleven, polka dots, polk, and number twelve, Taylor, for Taylor. Once you have the list in your mind, go through it forwards and backwards a few times to make sure it's all there. You can also link more information to the list so it becomes like a new peg list. You could link each vice president to your presidents, just like we did with the foreign words and capitals. You can also connect your links or stories to some of the other systems that you've already learned. You can link more than one concept at a specific place or compartment on the car, body, pegs, or journey method. This way, you can remember thousands of words or concepts by connecting links to a short mental journey. It's so powerful because we use more of our creativity and imagination to make the information outstanding, therefore stimulating our interest and curiosity, keeping our attention at a peak. Each word reminds you of the next. You're making your own links. And you're only memorizing two things at a time. You can also use this method to memorize paragraphs of information. All that you have to do is condense everything down to a list of key words, and then convert those lists into meaningful link stories. A whole syllabus or a book can be condensed into a ridiculous story. When you do this, it's easy to remember, giving you a great mental workout, and it's fun. Chapter Eleven. Remembering names. Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. That's a quote from Dale Carnegie. There's no such thing as a good or bad memory for names. There's only a good or bad strategy. In this chapter, you're going to learn strategies that can make a huge difference in your name memory. Make a commitment today to improve. It's also a commitment that will provide you with numerous benefits. And save you from many embarrassing situations. Get rid of your limiting beliefs about your name memory and start to focus on finding a strategy that can help you. Become motivated and interested in names and how we brand people according to that name. Imagine you meet a person and they say that they'll give you a million dollars if you could remember their name a week from today. Would you then remember it? Of course you would. 
We're all brilliant at names if we're motivated enough to hold on to them. The methods that I will be sharing with you have been used for centuries. They require you to think differently and to use your incredible associating mind. Some people say that they have tried association to remember names and it doesn't work for them. It doesn't work if you don't practice. Nothing in life works unless you work with it. All the memory champions are using association methods and can easily remember about a hundred names in less than half an hour. I believe that if you copy the strategies of the champions, you can get the same results. And if you don't, you won't. The untrained memory is not very reliable. The average person leaves their memory to chance, hoping that the name will somehow stick. The strategies that I will share with you work. Use them. Now, if you want to remember names like a memory master, you have to focus on the four C's. Number one is concentrate. When you meet someone with the same name as you, do you remember their name? Well, yes, because you're interested in that name. You always hear it, and your attention is at a peak. The name has meaning to you, and you also connect it to yourself. If you follow this basic strategy with every person that you meet, you'll remember their names. When we get introduced to people, they normally say their name so quickly that nobody can get it. Take control of the introduction. Be able to really get the name. You have to slow down the introduction. Put your elephant ears on and really hear the name. Make remembering names something that's important to you. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, "A person must get a thing before they can forget it." You need to really hear the name first. If you don't hear something, you will not remember it. You have to first get it to turn it into a memory. If you hear the name and repeat it back to the person, you'll improve your recall. If you don't hear the name, ask the person to say it to you again. If it's a difficult name, ask the person to spell the name too. Listen and get genuinely interested in the other person's name. We are normally so worried about being interesting that we forget to be interested. When you become interested, you'll want to listen to the name. Learn to listen to people from their perspective and not your own. Not only will it improve your name memory, but your social intelligence too. The second C is create. You have to create an image for the name in your mind to be able to recreate it later. Have you ever heard people say, "I know the face, but I can't remember the name"? You never hear people say, "The face is on the tip of my tongue." We remember faces because they form an image in our mind. The names don't normally stick because we try to remember it with our auditory memory, our little voice. It doesn't make sense to try to stick a sound to a vision. Of course, it won't stick. Plus, auditory memories are never as solid as visual memories. To hold on to a memory, we must make an image out of the name. Remember how we created images out of the names when we learned the precedents? When you give a name meaning, you can hold on to it. When you put a name into your mind and you don't do anything with it, it'll disappear and you won't be able to find it again. This is because working memory doesn't store information. So to store it, you need assistance from your short and long-term memory. You have to really think about the name to remember it because we only remember what we think about. When you're introduced to someone, you only have 20 seconds to think about the name and make an association. If you don't do anything with the name in 20 seconds, the name will be gone. The more connections and meaning you can give a name, the more it'll stick. Some of the names will naturally create a picture, like the surnames Baker, Cruz, or Gardner. My surname is Horsley, so you can think of a horse and Bruce Lee. My first name is Kevin, and it sounds like Kevin, making it easy to create an image and meaning out of my name. Other names may be more difficult, but by using a bit of creativity, any name can be given meaning and turned into a picture. The third C is connect. Remember that all learning is creating a relationship between the known and the unknown. You'll already know the face, so you need to connect the unknown name to the known face. When you see the face, it must act as a trigger or peg to bring the name to your awareness. Here are some methods to make the connection. All the methods you learn here take a great deal longer to explain than to use. The first one is the comparison connect. With this method, you connect the person to a name that you already know. Let's say we meet a person by the name of George. To make the name stick, we think of someone that we already know with the same name. Do you know another George? You may even think of someone famous with the same name, like George Clooney. Now all we do in our mind is compare the two people. What color hair does the George that we are meeting have? What color is the other George's hair? By comparing this one feature, you'll be able to pay more attention than you would have before, therefore making a stronger connection. Compare as many different features as you can, and you'll focus your attention and create a long-term impression for perfect recall.
It's as simple as that. Just compare the two faces in your mind and you'll remember them. Impact your memory even more by imagining the person with two heads, their own and that of the person you already know with the same name. I like this method because it helps you to both remember the new person as well as reinforce the other name too. This method only takes a few seconds to help you remember the person's name forever. We're using the memory principle of taking a long-term name and using it to remember the short-term new name. Some people ask what happens if you don't have a similar name to compare to. We can then use one of the other methods that I'll be showing you now. Find a system that works best for you. The second method is the face connection. With this method, you make a link between the name and an outstanding feature on the person's face. Every person's face is unique and every face has an outstanding feature. Let me give you an example. Imagine you're introduced to a woman and the first thing you notice about her face is that she has striking blue eyes. That will then be her outstanding feature. When she gives you her name, you will then have a place to put the name. Imagine she says her name is Janice. Then you make an image of the name. Janice sounds like chain ice. You then make the connection and think of a chain of ice flying out of her blue eyes. Here's another example. Imagine you meet a man and you notice that he has a big nose and his name is Peter. Turn the name into a picture. You can then imagine a pea eater. Then quickly make the connection that his nose is a big pea eater. By making a silly, memorable association, you'll connect the face and name together. With this method, never tell anyone that you've done it in your mind. It's personal, and some people may become offended. I remember once meeting a woman by the name of Hazel. She asked me how I remembered her name, so I told her. <laughs> Big mistake. I said I thought of a hazelnut. She was not impressed. Remember, most people identify with their names. They like it and consider it their own unique brand. If you make fun of it, you're making fun of them. A few questions that people ask about this system are, What happens if I meet four people, and all of them have an outstanding nose? Searching for the outstanding feature helps you focus on the face as you may never have done before. Most people never really look at the person when they're meeting them, so the feature is more about directing your focus on the face and making a connection. I've done a demonstration where I've remembered over a hundred names in half an hour using this method. When you meet a hundred people, you use many of the same features, but amazingly there is never any confusion. Go to Facebook to practice this method. There are millions of faces to choose from. Can I connect the name to the clothes of a person? Yes, but only if you notice the person's face too. People change clothes, but their faces are unique and don't change much. What happens if I find it hard to make a mental picture of the person's name? You can imagine writing their name on their forehead. Make sure you use a big fat red mental pen. It's all about creativity. If you create their name in your mind, you'll remember the name with as much ease as you remember the face. The third method is the meeting location connection. When we meet people for the first time, we tend to also remember the place that we first met them. The place makes a clear impression in our memory, but the name is nowhere to be found. With this method, we connect the name to the place where we met the person. We are using a journey peg to hold on to the name. Let's say we meet a woman by the name of Rose. Ask yourself, what will I remember about this place where I met her? Let's say you think you'll remember the buffet table. You then connect a big red rose to it, and when you think of the place, you'll think of her name. The final C, number four, is continuous use. If you concentrate and get the name, then make it meaningful and connect it to the person. Then this will enable you to remember the name for the short term. However, to make the name stick in your memory forever, you have to continue using it. Talk about the name. If it's a foreign name, ask the person what it means. How do you spell it? Also use the name in conversation. The more you talk about the name, the less you'll be relying on working memory, and you'll begin to store it. In your mind, ask yourself, what is that person's name again? Get the answer and then ask yourself, does that feel right? Try to strengthen the association during the course of the day or evening. Review the name. Create a names folder in your diary, on your computer, or on your mobile phone of people that you'd like to remember. Invite people you want to remember to one of your social networking sites so that you can review their names. Review the names often to keep them in your long-term memory. It's just a question of writing the name down and where you met the person. Look at the list every now and again, and you'll have a massive name memory filing system. You'll never be caught off guard for a name again. You can use these methods to remember hundreds of people at one meeting. They're all designed to improve your focus of attention, because when you remember others, they make a point of remembering you.
Chapter 12. Remembering Numbers. Here's a quote from Dominic O'Brien. Group a list of letters together and you have a word that represents something. An image, an emotion, a person. Throw a few numbers together and you have, well, you have another number. Numbers have become an important part of our lives, yet no one has shown us how to remember them. You can use external memory devices to remember numbers and you can choose to outsource your brain. But if you're in business and you can recall facts and figures without referring to your external brain or notes, then it builds trust and certainty. When you remember facts and figures, it builds confidence in your memory. It builds mental strength, and it's like gym for your brain. If you call out digits, the average person will only remember about seven digits forwards and only four to five backwards. If you have a trained memory, there are no limits. I can remember a 50-digit random number in less than 20 seconds and 100 digits in 45 seconds. I've taken my number memory far beyond all the limits that have been set in that area. Any person can produce the same results if they know the strategy. If you practice the methods and take pride in improving your memory, you can also develop these superhuman powers. Many people try to repeat numbers over and over again, trying to hold on to the number for dear life. They do more of what they've always done to try to improve their recall. We don't only improve with practice. If you repeat a bad habit over and over, it just gets worse. You also need a new method. We could use the number shape method to hold on to smaller numbers, but the method I'm about to show you has so many more possibilities and applications. What's easier to remember? American presidential candidates? Or the number 3472940121571110? Well, it's obviously American presidential candidates. It's easily understood. As soon as you say it, you memorize it. It has meaning and makes a visual image in your mind. The number has no meaning, and it's not very memorable. So to remember numbers, you need to give them more meaning. The systems that the memory masters use vary, but most of them use a system where you can change the numbers into words and then into images. We take the numbers and twist them into shapes so that they form letters. Then we turn the letters into words. Now this system seems like a lot of work, but once you have your code down, it'll make the process of remembering numbers a breeze. The code almost memorizes itself. Stick with it and open your mind to a whole new language. It's also a great way to exercise your verbal and numerical intelligence at the same time. Let's get started with learning the number code. Just go with this process. It'll all come together in a moment. Let's begin with the vowels. A, E, I, O, and U. These letters have no value. They act as fillers or blanks. The letters W, H, and Y are also fillers or blanks. They also have no value. Just remember that for now. Now see the numbers in the following letters. You can listen and then lock in the images by looking at them in the audiobook companion document. Zero is the S, Z, or C sound. S sounds like the hissing of a wheel, which looks like zero. One represents the T or D sound. The T and D have one downstroke, and that can help you remember that T and D is one. Two is the N sound. N looks like a two on its side. Three is the M sound. M looks like the number three on its side. If I make the word tomatoes, what will the number be? T is one. O has no value. M equals three. A has no value, T is 1, O has no value, E no value, and S is 0. The number would be 1310. What word could you make for 321? Three, 3 is an M, 2 N, and 1 a D or T. We have the letters M N T or M N D. Well, if we add the value I, we have the word mint. Or if we add a D at the end and the vowel E, we have mend. Or try the vowel A and add a Y. Then you can make the name Mandy. It's like learning a new number language. Four is the R sound. Think of the number four, and you can hear the R in four. Five is the L sound. If you lift up your hand, you have five fingers, and if you stretch your thumb out, it looks like the letter L. Six is the J, sh, soft, Ch or soft G sound. If you write the letter J in cursive, you can see the six in the letter J. If you've had too much to drink, you'll say the number six. Six is the J or the sh sound. 
What word can you make with 654? Jailer, J is 6, L is 5, and R is 4. 7 is the K or C sound. The letter K looks like two sevens connected to each other. 8 is the F or V sound. 8 looks like the letter F when you write it in cursive. 9 is the B or P sound. Looks like the mirror and upside down image of 9. So if I say cave, what's the number? 78. What word can you make with the number 98? How about beef? Do you now see how you can use this to remember any number? You may be saying, but now I have to remember a number and a word. No, it's like learning how to read. In the beginning, you really have to work hard to encode the information, but then it becomes easy. Think of the number 007. Instantly, you think of James Bond. We are trying to create the same experience with all numbers that you want to remember. We remember concrete information with ease. So you're not remembering more, you're just making it more memorable. It will take a bit of time to master, but once you have it, you'll have it forever. In the audiobook companion guide, you'll find a list of words for each number from 1 to 100. This method is great because you don't have to worry about spelling. It works on sounds. If you don't like some of the words in the companion document, then make up your own. Not only can you use this method to remember numbers, but it can also be used as a very effective giant peg memory system, too. The peg list memorizes itself. Memorize 10 a day. Let's say you want to memorize 10 to 15. For 10, the word is toes. Think of the 1 as T and the O as S. Then add vowels to make the word toes. Make a clear image of toes in your mind. For 11, think of the digits 1, 1. That is, D and D. Now fit in a vowel and we have Dad. See it clearly in your mind. When we get to 15, we can make the word doll. Remember, the system works with the sounds of the word, so the LL sounds like one L. So I prefer to use the word tail. There are many advantages to knowing this method of memory. You can use it to learn 100 bits of information easily and in order. Once you have these values, you can remember any numbers and there is no limit. When each number represents an image, you can hold the number in your mind and place it on a system to remember as many numbers as you choose. I've also used this method to remember athletic and sports statistics, stock prices, and any key information relating to numbers. This method also works well to remember important dates in history. I enjoy remembering dates because it links historical events to a timeline. Once this information is in your memory, it's easy to correlate it to other events. With this method, I'm able to remember up to 100 dates in 5 minutes. Plus, this is just another method that allows you to trap your thoughts and make information easier to recall. Here's how dates are remembered. 1926, television was first demonstrated. The way I remember this one is to only remember the last three digits, because most of the dates we need to remember are all in the last thousand years. We take the 926 and use the code to make the word PUNCH. P is 9. U has no value, N is 2, the CH is 6, punch. Now using the memory principles, we can imagine that you punch the television and it starts to work. 1969, people landed on the moon. We can see a bishop on the moon. 969, B is 9, I has no value, CH is 6, and P is 9. See a bishop walking on the moon and playing with the moon dust. 1901, the Nobel Prize was first awarded. We can imagine the first prize was made of pasta. Pasta makes 901. 1942, the first computer was developed. We can imagine a computer that looks like a barn. Barn is 942. The first submarine was built in 1801. See the submarine being built very fast. Fast is 801. 1784, the first newspaper was published. See caviar. Caviar is 784, all over the newspaper. This number method was developed in the 1700s by a man named Stanislaus Mink von Wenschein, who brought it to our conscious awareness. This method takes practice. You have to really work with it to make it work for you. Then there will be no limits to your number memory, and it will make you more knowledgeable. Chapter 13 is called The Art in Memory. Interest level is measured by how much you remember. That's a quote from Philip A. Bossert. In this chapter, I want to show you the power of turning information into art. All of the systems taught in this book can be enhanced by turning them into a drawing, painting, or picture. 
When you use more of your creativity, you'll be using more of your memory. It's a very simple method. You take information and you simply turn it into some form of art. And the information is remembered forever. It grabs your attention and your mind won't let go. As I've said before, every word is a picture drawn with letters. Every word can conjure up an image that can be drawn. And pictures register very quickly in the brain. If an image can be presented in 3D, it adds to the visual impact because that's the way things appear in the real world. You can achieve this by using Google Images, by getting an illustrator to make you drawings, you can cut out pictures from magazines, or you can just use doodles. Any art can help you to remember more. You can sculpt your information, you can paint it, or even act it out. The whole process is about creative remembering and becoming more associated and personally involved with the information. Use the power of Google Images to create memory diagrams. Place all the images in a Word or PowerPoint document and view it often so that when you look at the picture, it creates instant learning. Let me give you two examples in the audiobook companion document. The pictures are not professionally drawn. It's just a whole bunch of Google images placed together to make a linked picture. Have a look at the pictures and see how much registers in your mind. Link the pictures in a story, and it'll create an even stronger connection. The more deeply you think about any information, the more you will remember it. The first picture is a memory diagram of the 12 cranial nerves that emerge directly from our brain. The link starts with a picture of an old factory. Sounds like old factory. The second picture is a man picking up a right tick to remind you of optic. The third picture is a motor with a knife in it. It's a killer motor. Sounds like oculomotor. The fourth picture is a truck with clear written on it, which represents trochlear. The three gems are a reminder for trigeminal. Two cents for abducens. A lady having a facial is for facial. Vest being worn by a cock or vestibulocochlear. You can always add more to the picture if the picture doesn't trigger the whole word. The pharaoh has red lip gloss on for glossopharyngeal. The Las Vegas sign for the vagus nerve. The earrings are an accessory. And finally, the hippo with red lip gloss is for Hippoglossal. These pictures are all short mental reminders or triggers to help you recall the main content. By looking, linking, and locking in the image, you'll make the memory link stronger and easier to recall. Try it. The next example is a picture that will help you remember the first ten elements of the periodic table. First, we have a shiny yellow fire hydrant, hydrogen, with helium-filled balloons, helium, tied to the top of the hydrant. The helium balloons are touching the light bulb. Lithium. The light bulb is burning the different colored berries. Beryllium. The berries are being eaten by a smelly wild boar. Boron. A car with a bun attached to it. Carbon. That's crashing into the boar. Behind the car bun is a knight. Nitrogen. And out of his armor pops a scuba diving oxygen tank. Oxygen. The oxygen tank is being used by the woman with flu. Fluorine. The spluttering and sneezing flu woman has a massive neon sign, neon, that blinks on and off behind her. Look at the picture again. Make the links, and it will be installed in your memory. If you want to remember the entire periodic table, you could create a few pictures, and it will all be installed. You can also use memory diagrams to help children remember spelling. There are a few examples in the audio companion document. Any information can be represented as a drawing, painting, photograph, or sculpture. Make an effort to turn key information that you need for your life into a picture, so that you'll be able to easily see it in your mind's eye. Use art to remember. And have fun. Another great way to get your creative brain working for planning and remembering is mind mapping, which is a registered trademark of Tony Buzan. Your memory system operates so quickly and effortlessly that you seldom notice it working. That's a quote from Daniel T. Willingham. One of the best ways to watch your mind and memory at work is through mind mapping. When you adopt this method into your life, it'll change the way you think. It's a powerful way to organize information, to think on paper and get more out of your head. Tony Buzan is the inventor of mind maps and has authored over 80 books. He created this amazing mind tool in the early 1970s, and the method has evolved into one of the world's most effective learning and thinking tools. Tony calls mind mapping the Swiss Army knife for the brain. It's not only a method for expanding your memory, but a way to improve your thinking skills. Mind mapping can be used for memorizing, learning, presenting, communicating, organizing, planning, meetings, negotiating, and all types of thinking.
A mind map is a multi-sensory way of transferring your thoughts to paper. It's incredibly easy and simple to use. At first it may take a bit of practice, but then your brain will remember how to have fun, and your life and learning will never be the same again. Mind maps are a wonderful way of structuring information so that you can see the big picture and the details. With linear notes, which are lists and lines, you'll never have the flexibility that you have with mind maps. To be a successful mind mapper, all you need is the following. 1. Your brain. 2. A blank piece of paper. The bigger the better. And turn it to landscape. And 3. Lots of colored pens and pencils. The best way to explain a mind map is to map something out. You can have a look at the mind maps in the audiobook companion document. The mind map that I will be creating here is about all the systems that I've shared with you in this book. With every mind map, you start in the center of a blank page with a central image. This central image is what the whole mind map is about. Therefore, I'll call this central image systems. As we now know, images are memorable and stimulate more creativity. Step 2. Once you have your central image, then you connect branches to the central image and start branching out the headings. The main branches are all the memory systems we've covered. Step 3. Once we have our main branches, then we can connect second and third level branches to give more detail to each main branch. We can add even more branches to the existing branches to help clarify ideas or give more detail. Remember to use only one word per branch. This aids your associating mind to bloom freely and remember to add lots of images. Each main branch will also have one color. This helps visually to distinguish between different branches or content. A mind map can never end because your associating mind can always find just one more memory. Mind maps are entertaining. They're fun and make use of your creative brain. If you choose to stick with it, you'll take your mind to a new level. You'll improve your creativity, planning power, develop more of your brain, and increase your powers of memory and observation. You can use mind maps for a whole range of learning areas. They can be used very effectively to summarize large amounts of information and to get the gist of what's being communicated. In the companion document is a mind map that I made of the book The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You'll notice that each main branch shows a concept that we remembered on the car list. This mind map summarizes the key content from Stephen Covey's whole book. I created this mind map with iMindMap software. There are many mind mapping computer programs out there, but nothing comes close to the flexibility and usability of iMindMap. Play with it. You'll be surprised at how much you can achieve with this one thinking tool. Chapter 14 is called Using the Methods. We begin with this quote from Jim Rohn. Success is neither magical nor mysterious. Success is a natural consequence of consistently applying basic fundamentals. Now that you know the fundamentals of the memory methods, you can succeed with any information. By being more creative with information, it helps increase your involvement with the content, and it makes it part of your reality, therefore improving your memory. In this chapter, I want to share with you how you can adapt the methods to remember almost anything. I'll give you short guidelines on how to remember information word for word. Remember presentations, how to get rid of your absent-mindedness, remember playing cards, and how to remember anything that you choose to study. Number one, remembering written information word for word. Oscar Wilde said, memory is the diary that we all carry about with us. This is the method that I use to remember information word for word. If you work with this method, you'll be able to remember any written information with ease. You can use it to remember quotes, poems, definitions, or verses from religious text. Remembering information verbatim can help you in presenting, negotiations, or meetings. You can also use it to hold on to information so that you can call upon it when you need a bit of inspiration. It's also helpful in exams to remember key definitions of key concepts. Remembering and reciting poems is also a great way to train your mind and improve your presentation ability. Many religious texts refer to the importance of holding verses in your heart, so that you can live the lessons being taught. In this section, we'll be using a quote called, Success, that has been attributed to Ralph Waldo Emerson. The first element of this memory method is to find the key words that will help you remember the rest of the text. Listen to the key words that I picked out. Success. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children to earn the appreciation of honest critics 
and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you've lived. This is to have succeeded. Once you've found your keywords, the next step is to create images out of them and place it on one of the systems that you've learned in this book. Remember, it's like your imagination is the pen and the system is the paper. You can use a journey, your body, a car, or anything that's already in your long-term memory. You can even link all the concepts together like you did with the presidents. Let me get you started. Let's use a tree to remember the key concepts. Why a tree? Because it represents growth for me, and it's in your long-term memory. Imagine the roots, laughing, and intelligent people. You can imagine Einstein's are sitting at the base of the tree. Imagine children hugging the trunk of the tree, affection of children. And on the branches, you can imagine a nest, honest, full of critics. You'll notice that we've connected the first few key words to your system, and with a bit of repetition, you'll have it all in place. If you choose, you can continue to connect the rest of the information to the leaves, thorns, and the fruit, or to a park where the tree is planted. Once you have the key concepts, then you need to read through the material a few times. The key words will make the text stickier, and your knowledge of English will help you to remember the syntax. Make the material come to life, and you'll remember more. My friend, the late great Creighton Carvello, memorized Ernest Hemingway's novel *The Old Man and the Sea*, and each word's numerical position. For example, you might have asked him the sixth word on line fifteen of page eight, and he could have named it. He did not use rote learning. He used a method similar to the one I've just shown you. Like with anything in life, it takes a bit of practice to be able to remember text with ease. When you master this, you'll be able to remember any information that you need for your business or your life word for word. Actors have also successfully used this method to remember their lines. When you really know the information, you can feel and act it out more comfortably as well. Lesson two: Presenting from memory. The human brain is a wonderful organ. It starts working as soon as you're born and doesn't stop until you get up to deliver a speech. That's a quote from George Jessel. Do you enjoy watching a presentation where the presenter hides behind a piece of paper or a screen and reads all the information to you? No, you want to see a human being making eye contact and communicating freely. The purpose of any presentation is to get your audience to understand, believe, and act on what you say. If you, as a presenter, can't remember your own content, How's your audience meant to remember it? If they can't remember it, they're not going to believe or act on it. Many people are afraid of public speaking. I believe that the fear has a lot to do with fear of forgetting information. Many people say I might hit a blank. The methods that you've already learned in this book will provide you with a solution. If you work with the methods, you'll never blank out again. I've been giving professional presentations for 15 years now, and the last thing on my mind is the fear of forgetting information. When I present, I use the memory strategies, and the information is always there waiting for me to deliver it. I can also clearly remember jokes, slides, research, points that other people have said, and all my prepared content. I can loop back to any questions asked and be certain in my delivery. When you really remember the information, it builds confidence, and you'll look like you know what you're talking about. Presentation power is memory power. You can eliminate the fear of forgetting by using memory methods like the journey, body, car, peg list, drawing your own pictures, or making mind maps. Take charge and control of your content, because without notes, you'll look more professional in your delivery. When you present with the memory methods, it's like you're reading from a teleprompter. You're not learning the information word for word, but you're clearly remembering the structure. If you don't move an audience, you're not managing your content correctly. Great presenters know that audiences tend to remember the first and last bits of the presentation. Therefore, they make their introduction and conclusion powerful and outstanding. They make their introductions more outstanding by opening with a memorable demonstration, question, fact, quote, or a meaningful story. They also continually link information to the audience, making it more outstanding, and keep repeating the main points. You can design your presentation with this floor principle in mind. In a presentation, we tend to remember F, first things, L, last things, O, outstanding information, O, 
own links, and R, repeated information. If you use this principle, you'll get your audience to remember more, making your presentation more enjoyable. If you have a clear structure installed in your head, it'll be easier to move your audience. You'll look more confident, and you'll be a much more powerful presenter. Our third part, called Absent Minds, Anonymous said, is the object lost or are you lost? Have you ever had this experience? You're sitting in your room and you think, I'm going to make chicken for dinner. You then walk to the kitchen and when you get there you think, what am I doing here? You may even open the refrigerator door thinking the refrigerator will provide you with your answer. Or have you ever parked your car and you can't find it when you get back? Have you ever wondered if you've taken your vitamins or other medication? And don't you just hate it when you put your car keys down and when you need them you can't find them? If any of this has ever happened to you, then you are normal. Yeah, normal. This all happens because familiarity breeds forgetfulness. All of our routines sometimes create a state of autopilot, and we often don't attend to what we're doing. The good news is that 95% of the time you're not absent-minded. You remember where you put your car keys, you can find your car again, and you don't put your pants in the fridge. Yet we beat ourselves up for the mistakes we make 5% of the time. If you keep your focus on your absent-minded moments, you're going to create more absent-mindedness. Start to catch your memory doing things right, and you'll start to see improvements. It's been estimated that people squander 40 days annually trying to remember things they've forgotten. People are becoming increasingly absent-minded as they struggle to cope with constant streaming of information from mobile phones, the Internet, radio, and television. With all our technology and systems in place, we should be more at peace, but we seem busier and more stressed than ever. As a result, we are regularly misplacing items or forgetting people's names. We are living in an activity illusion and keeping our minds full of busyness. No wonder we are absent-minded. Making excuses for your absent-mindedness doesn't solve anything. So what is the solution? When you put items down, like your car keys, you need to bring yourself back to the present moment. Ask yourself questions like, when am I going to use this next? Or say to yourself, I'm putting the keys on the table. Or you could imagine that your keys are exploding the table. Try anything different to bring yourself back to the moment. Most things in life can be solved with more responsibility and awareness. In Chapter 4, I talked about being all there. When you start to single task instead of trying to do a hundred things at once, then you'll start to be more focused. Take action today. Clear the clutter. Get organized. Think on paper. Bruce Sterling said chaos is the sexiest excuse for laziness ever invented. Creating systems and using habitual places to put your items will save you massive amounts of time. Do yourself a favor and stop trying to get attention for your absent-mindedness. I hear you protesting. Well, why do you tell other people about these incidents if you didn't get attention for it? Decide today to rather bring yourself back to the power of now and pay more attention to the moment. Part 4. Remembering Playing Cards Without a method, the average person will only be able to remember about half a pack of cards in 30 minutes, if they're lucky. The average person doesn't have a way of trapping thoughts, so they're never really certain of what they know. With the method that I'm about to teach you, you'll be able to remember a shuffled pack in a few minutes. With the same methods, I've been able to remember a pack in 45 seconds. With a bit of practice, you'll be able to do the same. Remembering cards has many mental benefits. It's a great way to train your memory. It can help you in card games like Blackjack and Bridge, plus it has the added bonus of being a great demonstration of your memory power. Knowing what you've already learned in this book, you now know that to remember something well, you need to bring it to life. So how do you bring cards to life? Well, first, we must create a picture for each card. Each card must have its own identity, so that you can distinguish it from the others and then place it on a long-term place or system. You can associate each card with a person that you know, or you can make all the diamond cards celebrities. All the heart cards, your family, spade cards, people you work with, and the club cards, your friends. That would be one way of organizing it. With the system that I use, you'll need to know the number code system from Chapter 12. The card system works in the same way as with numbers. Only this time, the first letter of each suit will start the name of each card. For example, the three of diamonds will be D for diamonds, and three, or M. Add a vowel and you have DAM. All the diamond cards will start with a D, all the hearts will start with an H, etc. And then you just add the converted number to the end of the card. In the audiobook companion document, you can find all the images for all the suits. 
Once you've created images for each of the cards, you'll have to get to know them. It'll take a bit of time practicing getting the card to automatically turn into the image, but with time, it will become second nature. To remember the whole shuffled pack, you then create a journey of 52 places, and you store each character on the journey, or you can link the cards together. These methods are not tricks. You're just using the memory fundamentals and therefore maximizing more of your memory potential. This is Memory Gym. The more you work with it, the more your overall memory will improve. It's a way to practice your memory skills. I know many people are not going to put any effort into remembering cards, but at least now you know how. This is just another example of how these methods can be applied to solve any memory problem. Part 5. Studying Anything Learning new information isn't helpful unless it can be recalled later. Anything that increases one's memory power increases access to everything learned. That's a quote from Richard Restack, M.D. There is no learning without memory. The more you can enhance your memory, the better you'll be able to learn. In every course, there's some theory that needs to be remembered. The quicker you can get the theory down, the more time you can spend on practicing the information. Many of the first and second year university subjects are mostly memory-based. If you have a strong memory system in place, you'll succeed in anything that you choose to study. There are a few things you should consider to enhance your performance in your area of study. First, never learn just to pass an exam. What's the purpose of doing well in an exam and not knowing what you've learned two weeks later? Learning's not a destination. It is a continuous process. All the A students that I've ever interviewed prepare and plan their learning. They do little bits over time and don't stress before an exam because all the hard work has already been done. All the F students overdose on energy drinks the night before and stress their way through the information, hoping it'll stick for the exam. So break your learning down and master the material over time. Before you study anything, make sure you have a strong pick. Remember purpose, interest, and curiosity? Make sure you have that in mind. Review Chapter 4 to get more details on the pick principle. Your vision will determine how much energy you'll have for your learning and how hard you'll be willing to work. When studying, it's also important to take breaks, as our mind can remain focused for only so long before we become unproductive and tense. When you return from a break, you will feel refreshed and do more work in less time. Every 35 to 40 minutes, take a break, take a walk, and get away from whatever you're working on, and give your mind a rest. Get an overview and analyze the material that you have to cover. Mark out all the areas that you need to remember. In any subject, the same concepts keep coming up, so make images for these key concepts and create an image vocabulary. This is so that you don't have to keep on finding images for information that you've already created. Then create a memory system that will work for each section and store the information. Record your systems and go through them a few times to make sure you have all the content in your head. I've had students that have used one shopping center to remember their entire syllabus. Using the methods shared in this book, You'll never have the experience of not being able to get information into your head again. No matter what information you need to learn, these methods can be adapted so that you can find a solution and make the information sticky. I've helped thousands of people to learn all kinds of material for school and university. I've helped medical students, law students, pilots, policemen, nurses, medical reps, miners, ornithologists, marketers, and engineers. There isn't an area of study that won't benefit from these methods. These methods have no limits. The only limits are the excuses and judgments that you may place on them with your whining mind. Some people say, I'm not creative and I don't make pictures. Well, when I hear people say that to me, all I hear is, I'm too lazy to put in the effort. If you choose to believe in limits, you will live a limited life. Part 3 continuous use. We start that with a quote from Dennis Waitley. Habits begin as off-handed remarks, ideas, and images, and then, layer upon layer, through practice, they grow from cobwebs into cables that shackle or strengthen our lives. Chapter 15 is called Self-Discipline, and here's another quote for you from Mark Spitz. He won seven gold medals in the 1972 Olympics. We all love to win, but how many people love to train? There's never, ever been an undisciplined world champion. Our rewards are always directly proportional to our efforts. It sometimes takes years of training to develop abilities in the area in which we'd like to achieve success. People say, 
That person has such talent. But they never look down the road to see how many hours have been spent training. If you want to master the skills that you have learned in this book, or if you want to master anything, you need self-discipline. Self-discipline is not self-deprivation. It's about raising your standards and going for and being more. Many people think that things are going to magically appear in their lives. Think about it. People want beautiful, healthy teeth, but they don't have the self-discipline to floss them. Is it expensive? Does it take a lot of time? Is it difficult to do? It's none of these. How can they expect to change any area of their lives if they can't even bring themselves to do that? So why don't people floss? I once read an article on CNN.com that stated, "Up to 59% of glaucoma patients regularly skip their eye drops, even though untreated glaucoma can lead to blindness. If you have glaucoma, you're going to lose your eyesight if you don't use your drops. Why don't people do it? People simply don't do it because they think that the future will be a better place than today without doing anything to make it better. What do you want? What are you doing daily?" If your daily actions are not moving you in the direction of what you want, then you'll never get what you want. Common sense, isn't it? It's not that your goals are physically impossible; it's more that you lack the self-discipline to stick to them. There are four keys to creating more self-discipline in your life, and the first one is create a vision. Your inner vision and your energy are connected. If you wake up in the morning and focus on all the bad things that could possibly happen in a day, your energy level will be low. If you wake up and imagine all the exciting possibilities and focus on all the great things that you get to do, your energy level lifts. Where your attention goes, your energy flows. David Campbell said, "Discipline is remembering what you want. The more reasons you have to do something, the better your inner movie will be, and therefore the more energy you'll create to do it. If your excuses are high and your reasons are low, you'll have no discipline to start." If your reasons are high and your excuses are low, you will have lots of motives, and motives in action create motivation. Always ask yourself, how badly do I want it? If you really, really want it, you'll create a strong vision, and you'll have the self-discipline to do it. Part two, make a decision. All change happens only when you make a true decision to change. When you make a true decision, you'll not allow for any other possibility. Make a commitment to yourself. That this is the way that you're going to live your life. For anything to happen in your life, you have to schedule it. Decide to make it part of your routine. Part three: Stop listening to your feelings. Albert Hubbard said, "Self-discipline is the ability to make yourself do what you should do when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not." When people want to start a task that they have to complete and say something like, "I'll do this tomorrow," a loop closes in their mind and they are happy to continue without doing it. Because they'll do it tomorrow. The problem is that when tomorrow comes, the same loop just repeats itself. Or if you say, "I just don't feel like it," a loop closes because you've tricked yourself into thinking that you'll do it when you do feel like it. These pictures and voices that we control create our feelings. If you want emotional mastery, learn to take control of these pictures, movies, and voices that you run in your mind. Some people will say, "I have to listen to my inner voice because it guides my intuition." Listen to your intuition or feelings when you're deciding to pass a truck on a busy road, making a massive decision, or whether you should climb into an elevator with a freaky-looking guy. But when you're following a discipline, these feelings only get in the way. If you have to floss your teeth, you don't have to consult your intuition. Just do it. When you have to exercise, you don't have to listen to your feelings. Just do it. William James said, "The more we struggle and debate, the more we reconsider and delay, the less likely we are to act." Schedule a time in the day for memory training and practice, whether you feel like it or not. And part four, daily action. If you want to develop a habit, then the only way to achieve this is by doing something daily. You have to review your new skill to renew it. Only by consistently practicing your discipline can you turn it into a skill. Most of the research that I've read says it takes 21 days to develop a new habit. In my experience, it takes a lot longer. Some people think that once the 21 days are up, the brain will then take over. Then, after 21 days, they give up, waiting for their brain to do the rest. Self-discipline requires you to make a decision daily. Self-discipline requires you to start fresh every day. Every day is a new day. You don't have to practice this skill for the rest of your life. Just for today, I believe that life does not reward idleness. 
If you put your arm in a sling for a week, you start to lose the use of many of your major muscles. Your brain is made of flesh and blood like the rest of your body. So if you use it, it will improve, and if you don't, you'll lose it. The only way you get good at anything is through self-discipline. Remember, life only rewards action. Chapter 16. Review to Renew You know as well as I do that it's entirely wrong to assume that any subject matter which we once learned and mastered will remain our mental property forever. That's a quote from Bruno First. It's been estimated that two years after leaving school, the average person only remembers three weeks' worth of lessons. Think about it. In your own life, do you still remember all those theorems? That means that after 12 years, all you have left is three weeks. The average person that passes a test today would never pass that same test four weeks later. Final exams are really final. In Spitzer's experiment, it was found that the average person who learns textbook material without memory methods remembers only the following. After day one, 54%. After 7 days, 35%. After 14 days, 21%. After 21 days, 19%. After 28 days, 18%. Now this shows that the average student only remembers 18% of their work after a 28-day holiday. That means the lecturer or trainer only has 18% of the knowledge to build new knowledge onto. The average company or student loses 82% of the information or 82 cents out of every training dollar after 28 days. Any training is a waste of time if there's not a process of review. Many people feel that they can never forget the information that they learned using the memory methods and systems. The memory methods make the learning process fun and more effective. They create such a strong impression, and it's so different to your mind that you have to remember it, and consequently it sticks. The methods help to store the memory quickly for a medium term. But to make sure that the information remains in your mind, you need to review and recite it. The reason we review is to make the information more solid in our minds. The only way we can build on a memory is if we can remember it. Your memory is like a bank. The more you put into it, the more it grows. Review also helps you to create more long-term memories. Repetition or rote learning on its own without the methods is no fun. It takes long and can often result in an aversion to learning. Memorizing should be a pleasure. It should be more like a game. Reviewing when using the memory methods doesn't require a lot of time. It's just a process of thinking about it and making sure that the pictures are strong and that you can clearly see them. Then recite any information that you want to stick in your mind. I've found that if you review your information in a specified time frame, you increase recall. If you repeat it after 10 minutes of learning the information, it will remain in your memory for at least an hour. The first review should always be done backwards. Reviewing images backwards helps you to remember them more effectively. If you learn concepts in reverse, you create a new impression in your mind, and this makes information more outstanding. It just seems to make the memory so much stronger. Once you've done this, you review at longer and longer intervals. Review after one hour, then one day, three days, seven days, 14, 21 days, 28 days, two months, three months, and then it should be in your memory forever. During the first 72-hour period, the knowledge transfers into a deeper, stronger memory. So if you're using a route or journey system after the first 72 hours, you'll be able to reuse the journey for new information. However, if you have information that you want to keep forever, rather assign it its own route or system and review it often. Review takes discipline, but it keeps information fresh in your mind. It keeps it alive. It keeps it awake so that you can connect more information to that existing information. The more that you connect to that information, the stronger the information becomes. Your mind is the only computer in the world with this characteristic. The more you put into it, the more it will hold. The perfect way to learn is to make lots of firsts and lasts by having lots of breaks. Make your information outstanding. Make your own links using memory methods and then you review it to keep it ready in your mind for new learning. No matter how many times you memorize something, you'll have to start over from the beginning if you let yourself forget it. You have to spread out your revision over longer and longer periods of time. If you use it, you'll strengthen the information, and you'll remember it. When you review, it helps you to think more about what you're remembering.
By thinking about it, you begin to really understand it, too. It's important to use this information when remembering names. Only if you review them are you going to remember them. If you use the information often, it acts as a review. You either use it or you lose it from your instant recall. You should always use the power of review to put a lid on your learning to prevent your learning from escaping. We've learned that the only way that you improve is to get rid of anything that's preventing you from improving. So we got rid of the blocks to your mind, like excuses, limiting beliefs, and learning to single task. And then we became more willing to learn more. Then we learned how to improve through the C principle of imagination. We've learned the different memory methods, the link story method, memory art, the body and car method, the route or journey method, the peg system, the number code, and remembering names. These methods are only limited by your own imagination and level of self-discipline. We now also know how to review. Remember to review to renew. Endings are the seeds for beginnings. Dennis Waitley said, If you're hoping to harvest a life of great deeds, remember you first have to plant some great seeds. You are the choice of all your memories, and remembering is a choice. There's no magic when it comes to memory improvement. There's only management. Memory skills are an important tool in your self-improvement arsenal. I've given you many tools, but remember, batteries are not included. You need to provide the energy to make it work. The information you've received will change your life for the better. Use it. Memory training will enable you to create more certainty with information. Certainty fosters confidence and will give you a glimpse of your amazing ability. Bryce Martin said, The possibilities of thought training are infinite, its consequences eternal, and yet few take the pains to direct their thinking into channels that will do them good, but instead, leave all to chance. Today, you have two choices. You can take the first option, you can leave it all to chance and do what you've always done, but you'll get what you've always gotten. Or you can take the pains and decide today to take the second option. Do different to become different. Take these tools, make them your own, practice hard, and unleash the power of your memory. May you never forget what's worth remembering, nor ever remember what's best forgotten. That's an old Irish blessing. About the Author for over 25 years, Kevin Horsley has been analyzing the mind and memory and its capacity for brilliance. He's one of only a few people in the world to have received the title International Grand Master of Memory. He's a World Memory Champion medalist and two-time world record holder for the Everest of Memory Tests. Kevin is also an author of four books and the designer of a times table game with the